Studies, Mecca, Mexico, Palestine. Um, today's open classroom event, we um, are going to have Dr. Blanca Messe and uh, Dr. Leslie uh, Quintanilla uh, and Dr. Obama Abdelhadi. Um, and I think we can start by like a very brief round of introductions, maybe like 30 seconds about mm -hmm. affiliations and where people are coming from. Um, I guess I'll begin to mm -hmm. set the tone. My name is Salim. I am a PhD student at UCLA Anthropology. I did my master's here at San Francisco State University, where my project was on the oral history of the General Union of Palestine students um, from 2000 to 2017. Um, and I'm now a member of the Ahmed faculty here at SS State. Okay, uh, my name is Blanca Misse. I teach here in the Modern Languages Department. I teach French and Francophone language cultures, whatever, they make me teach, they allow me to teach. I <laughs> am um, also a member of the executive board of our union, faculty union, the CFA, and I've been involved in uh, making our union a fighting union, a democratic union, and also a union that stands for academic freedom rights. Mm. Our colleague, in particular, of my friend and comrade, uh, Professor Baba Abdul Hadi, who's been the target of uh, vicious Zionist attacks on our campus, and the administration has failed to protect her. And the union is working very hard to ensure mm -hmm. that. And as head of that, I'm also a social and political militant here in the community. So I'm very much involved, of course, in the struggle for the liberation of Palestine, but also to end the camps, detention camps, and open the borders and uh, fight for legalization for all in this country. Mm -hmm. And my name is Asikin Tania, um, Women and Gender Studies Department here. I have been involved throughout decade and a half with um, migrant rights movements, particularly at the US-Mexico border, um, but more specifically organizing for autonomy, um, to dismantle borders, indigenous sovereignty, land, water movements, um, particularly with the Zapatistas. Okay, and my name is Rabab Abdul Hadi. I'm actually the instructor of this class. I'm the director and senior scholar of the Arab and Muslim ethnicities and diaspora studies program here at San Francisco State. And uh, I'm, uh, I've been involved, been a long time community organizer actually, throughout, before I became an academic. So my academic life is sort of secondary. Uh, came in much, much later than my, uh, but I carry my activism in it and I believe in being a scholar activist. Somebody who produces knowledge for justice and also is committed to changing the world towards justice and for a better world for all. I do believe and advocate what um, um, I call is the indivisibility of justice, that we cannot just call for justice for anybody without calling for justice for all. And today's class is, do you want to talk about the class, Salim? Salim, by the way, is faculty at Ahmed is helping, so <laughs> it's really in volunteer capacity. Okay, so he's not paid by San Francisco State University. Salim. Um, do you want to say something about the class, or do you want me to start with If you could start okay. with the class, then I'll continue with the So the class, this is the Comparative Border Studies class, Palestine and Mexico, and I'm mindful of what you said, so I, we, should, we should have a discussion about it. But uh, yeah, so I, I want to have a discussion about what the, that means, and so that the critique that we wrote, which I actually, I, I think is a very bad critique. Today is also the anniversary of September 11, 2001. And as we said earlier, there isn't one 9-11. Uh, at the very least, we today remember September 11, 1973, the overthrow of the democratically elected president, Salvador Allende, in Chile. That was a coup that was concocted by the CIA, Central Intelligence uh, Agency, and that many people were killed. There was um, a fascist rule that was imposed by General Pinochet for very many, many years and that many people went missing, many people were disappeared, uh, many people were imprisoned and tortured. Uh, it was, uh, so it's very important to think about when people say 9-11, and this is something that we talk about in the class, there isn't one 9-11. It's not, doesn't necessarily mean the 9-11 is the one. It's also to rem remember that uh, there are, there is loss of life all around, and there are many people who have lost their lives along the way. And um, this, the United States considers a watershed moment. 
uh, many people around the world have had many multiple watershed moments. That's really important to understand. And so uh, today, uh, I'm, what I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, um, yeah, so today's class, the earlier class, we had the symposium, Colonial Geographies, Border Crossings, Palestine, um, Kashmir, Kashmir, Palestine, Mexico. Uh, it was the class on Edward Said. And we actually, the, our focus was on covering Islam, the way the imagery, the construction of imagery, and the critique of that, and so on. So we began talking about what are, the, what are some of the similarities, what are the differences in comparative in comparative border studies and comparisons implies not everything is exactly the same. There are many more contradictions and tensions than uh, there are things that are similar to each other. In this class, today we are um, focusing on the question of what does the day mean? Also, how do we think about the question of indigeneity, settler colonialism, 1492, what does mean? And how do we think about that both in terms of our intellectual critical thinking and also in terms of our daily activism and so on. What do we do in the school? What do we do inside the school? What do we do outside? Do we leave our academic, uh, our activism outside and we just come in into the, and, and produce what people claim to be value free? Uh, neutral studies, well, I, I don't uh, subscribe to that. I argue against it. I do not believe there is such a thing that's called value free. Mm -hmm. uh, when people that's consider that's things compliant. controversial. Hmm? Compliant. Yeah. And when people say something is controversial, mm -hmm. they are only talking about issues that uh, some, uh, contradict the status quo, challenge the status quo. So then it's deemed controversial. But if it's perpetuating the status quo, it's supposed to be normal, business as usual, and so on. So we want to disrupt that. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do, actually, I was going to share um, excerpts. I can, I can yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. So um, Dr. Okay. Bahadi is, we're actually going to have a book reading. Um, excerpts not from well, not a book reading, or yeah, excerpts from the book reading um, of her uh, of her article and chapter. Where is home? Fragmented lives, border crossings, and the politics of exile. <coughs> Originally published in Radical History Review, and uh, republished in the anthology um, co-edited by Dr. Rabab Abdelhadi, Arab and Arab American Feminisms, um, Gender Violence and Belonging. Uh, winner of the 2012 Arab American Book Award for nonfiction writing. Um, and with that, I think you're going to read a few excerpts from it. Yes, and I just wanted to say that I actually wrote this, and today I, I don't know if it, I tried to post it on Facebook, but I'm not sure if it got posted. But um, I wrote this piece because after 9 11 2001, it was very difficult for any of us to express ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, uh, people who spoke. Cri critically questioned what was happening. They were uh, targeted, they were vilified. And I'm talking about people like Oprah Winfrey and, and uh, Donahue, let alone some people like us. So uh, I wanted to, be, I wanted to um, pr produce critical knowledge. I wanted to say something. I felt like I had to say something. I didn't have a choice. But uh, it was very difficult to be able to say it. So I basically ended up writing reflections and reflexes essay and at the same time it was quite problematic for me because I'm, I'm, I'm a feminist scholar I, I cause subscribe to activism and being involved and so on so it was really problematic to kind of like only put things in the words of sort of like individualized mm -hmm. human rights or human experiences and so on I tried as much as possible to critique and engage and I, I'll share it with you and you can tell me uh, what so I basically wrote this about this about what's happening in the US what's happening in Palestine what's happening in the different parts of the world there was at that time Ahmed Diallo was mm -hmm. an African immigrant who was shot 41 times and killed in New 51. York and uh, 51 times okay, I don't, okay. 51. All right. <laughs> and uh, there was the bombing of Afghanistan had just mm -hmm. started and there were people were getting arrested and disappearing and so on. So I'm going to read some of it, and then if I go a lot over, uh, please tell me to stop. For the politically exiled, going home means more than taking a journey to the place where one was born. The ability to go, the decision to embark on such a trip, and the experience of crossing borders to one's quote unquote native land involves an examination of the makeup of the individual and the collective sense. A definition and a redefinition of the meaning and the location of home, and a re-examination of one's current and former political commitments. In the Palestinian case, 
Going home assumes further complications, especially in view of the Israeli law of return that bestows automatic citizenship on Jews arriving in Israel while denying the indigenous Palestinian population the right to return to Palestine and to the homes from which they have been, uh, been uprooted since 1948. For the Palestinian exile then, going home brings back memories of one's worst nightmares at international borders, interrogation and harassment, suspicion of malintent, and rejection of one's chosen self-identification. Going home ceases to be just about traveling to where one was born. Instead, going home is transformed into a politically charged project in which the struggle for self-identification, self-determination, freedom and dignity becomes as salient as one's physical and mental safety. Do we belong? Home is a safe space. When life under Israeli occupation became worse in Palestine, my siblings and I began a campaign to convince my parents to leave. My parents would refuse again and again. Whenever pressed, they would invariably say, our faith is not different from others. Or, are we better than other people? When we persisted, they would respond by invoking Palestinian disposition. No one will ever repeat what happened in 1948. My brother and sister-in-law shared my brother's, my parents' sentiments. They were nonetheless contemplating a relocation to give their daughters a better education, a safe environment, and a nascent childhood. Nasser, Lana, and the girls never left Israeli and ex-Jerusalem, though. With the closure of U.S. borders to Arabs and Muslim immigrants, it did not look like they would make it to New York anytime soon. But I did. On August 27, 2001, I came back from a year in Egypt, where I taught at the American University in Cairo. I returned home to this anonymous city to take in its cultures, to thrive in its rhythms, to disappear and reappear in sea of accents, tongues, cultures, and lifestyles. Two weeks later, my life came to a standstill, and so did the lives of hundreds of thousands of Arabs, Arab Americans, Muslim Arab Americans, and Central and South Asians. Besides the fear for our loved ones, whom we could not locate for several hours on that infamous day, we no longer felt, felt safe. No longer could we draw on New York City's rich, vibrant, and diverse cultural scene. As you can see, I'm critiquing myself as I'm going along. Mm -hmm. And no longer could we enjoy the anonymity of the city in the manner in which we enjoyed before. We rationalize things to make ourselves feel better. We are alive. Our loved ones are alive. It's more than what many New Yorkers could say. We should be grateful. But my mother's words ring in my ear. Whatever happens to other people will happen to us. Be careful if you happen to be named Osama, or even if you own the restaurant named Osama's place. You should worry if your last name is Abdul, Ahmed, Muhammad, or Mas'ud. Change your name if you can, from Muhammad to Mike. Mm -hmm. If you're Jamal, Jimmy might be a safer bet. Americanize. Be thankful for winter. Wear a heavy, long coat and a big hat. It allows you to hide your beliefs from the public space that's supposed to accommodate all beliefs. If you're a Sikh man or a devout Muslim woman, do not parade your convictions in public. In public. The public is too narrow for you. Do not speak up. Save your words. Try not to use words with a P if you are an Arab. If, may, if you mix it up with a B, someone will ask, where are you from? Do you really want to answer? Try to avoid situations in which you have to present an ID. Do not drive a car. Do not use a credit card. Paying cash, avoid if as much as you can being you. Pass if you can. Melt in this melting pot. Do not cry multiculturalism and diversity. This is not the time. Better save your life. Better yet, go home foreigner. But what if you have no home to go back to? What if this is your home? Divided loyalty, not a real American. But what do you mean? Are you speaking of those to whom this land belongs? before anyone else, how many quote-unquote real Americans are left mm -hmm. after quote-unquote the civilized Europeans arrived? Mm -hmm. Crossing borders, passing and passing through, September 11, 2001. I'm stuck at 96th Street and Lexington Ag Avenue. I can't get home, no trains are running. I desperately need to hear Jaime's voice, to know that he is alive. A long line is getting longer at the phone booth. I begin walking aimlessly, hoping to find an available phone to call my mother-in-law. 
Right in front of me, a woman is pushing a baby carriage, starts to cross the street. Her head is covered. I'm debating whether to say something. Finally, I decide to approach her. Go home. Immediately, I realize how awful I must have sounded. She looks at me with a mix of fear and resentment, too polite to ask me to, my mind, to mind my own business. I'm probably too afraid to fight back. I come closer and declare a part of me I never declared before. I'm a Muslim like you. Go back home now. You cannot run with a baby. When they realize what has happened, they will attack. I'm already bracing myself for their attacks against us. My hand instinctively goes to my neck to hide the chain with the Quranic inscription my students Ghali and Hidayat gave me before I left Cairo. Luckily, I had forgotten to put it on today. My split lives are on collision course again. I feel like be such a traitor for passing. But wouldn't it be better to pass today? Do I really want to identify with them though? Do I want to escape the collective guilt by association? The fate of my fellow Arabs, Palestinians, and Muslims? Should I renege on my roots? Better tread lightly. Today is not the time for bravado, I tell myself. The thought of what will happen to women in the hijab sends shivers down my back. But we all make choices, one part of me says. Not always as we please, the radical in me shouts back. Of course, I'm referring, referencing marks. I'm skipping. September 13th, 2001. I'm working at home. No one is allowed below 14th Street in Manhattan unless she or he can prove a legitimate reason. The mayor of New York City declares. I'm so grateful that I can't go home. I still do not have a valid ID. September 11th was the day on which my NYU ID paperwork was to be completed. So I could teach my first lecture, Introduction to Women's Studies. A police car stops in front of the house. Almost automatically, I begin to suspect that they've come for me. I'm aware that I should not be concerned. I've done nothing wrong. But deep down, I am worried. I start thinking of the reasons. Maybe a neighbor called and said that a Palestinian lives here. Maybe because our house has no flags, while the neighbors are full of them. Flags are everywhere, on the car, doors, windows, poles. Our next door neighbor has two flags in the front of the, her house, two on the back porch, one on a planter, two on her car. Has, her, her husband has three van, flags on his van. Another road back home, May 14th, 1998. I'm leaving Ramallah on the eve of the 50th anniversary of Nakba, or Palestinian disposition. My cousin's children ask if I want to hoist the Palestinian flag with the slogan of the occasion, so we will not forget on the car. Sure, why not, I say. I exit Palestinian Authority Area A and drive through Area B with joint Israeli-Palestinian patrol. Palestinians control the population, Israel controls everything else, according to Oslo. I catch the highway to Nablus. It's a beautiful summer day. I should make it home in 30 minutes or so. So far, so good. At the fork, one direction leads to Ofra, a Jewish settlement built on a sparsely olive, olive tree dotted hilltop. The other road to which I'm allowed passage because of my US citizenship leads to Area C, part of the West Bank 1967 border, but under total Israeli control, and Aber Samira. Aber Samira, or the Samaria Bypass, is a modern highway carved out of West Bank mountains by then Israeli Minister of Infrastructure Ariel Sharon to shorten the commute to West Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and thus attract quote-unquote ordinary and quote-unquote secular Israelis who are not quote-unquote ideologically drawn to the settlements to make their home there. Winding through Palestinian towns and villages where residents are not allowed to use, the Samaria bypass also links the network of Israeli settlements, sparing the most almost 200,000, of course now much more, settlers from the constant reminders of the Palestinians whose land was seized, just like the greenery that you talked about, mm -hmm. whose land was seized to construct these privileged gated colonies with their lush gardens, children's playgrounds, and Palestinian-style rooftops. I'm gonna skip, 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 skip. June 10th, 2001. The plane is approaching the airport, butterflies in the stomach, excited to arrive soon to be home, soon to see parents and the 16 nieces and nephews. She disembarks and gets on the bus, a short distance, and we are at border control, standing in a line marked foreigner for foreign passports. Butterflies in the stomach, fear and anxiety. Did I clean up my wallet? 
Did I remove all the business cards from the briefcase? Mm -hmm. Is my calendar clean? Did I erase suspect dates? What should I say if they ask about the letters from the kids in Shatila to their friends in Haitian? I rehearse my story and remind myself to limit my answer to yes or no. No need to elaborate. This is where they try to trick you. It only prolongs the interrogation. Do I smile or keep a straight face? Be rude or docile? Which image should I present to the world today? What do I do? Here it comes. Here we go again. King Hussein Bridge, July 1994, going in. Ben-Gurion Airport, July 2001, getting out. Rabab, what's the purpose of your visit to Israel? A young woman behind the counter asks. I'm a bit annoyed for being addressed by my first name. Almost wanted to say, do I know you? But I bite my tongue and maintain my calm. I respond that I'm visiting the Palestinian areas to see my family. She asks, you have family in Israel? Where do they live? I say, Nablus. She says, Shechem. The Hebrew name Israel gave to my hometown. I calmly say, Nablus, yes. Now I'm directed to step aside so my luggage will be searched. An undercover intelligence officer approaches me, declaring that he is from Israeli security and wants to ask me a few questions and that it's for my own safety. I do not bother to question his concerns. I have been through enough. I'm too tired. I just want to get home. He and a young female soldier search my bags, taking everything out and spreading my clothes on the table. My underwear is there for everyone to see. An elderly Palestinian man is being searched at the next table. We pretend not to notice each other's intimate belongings. But my face is getting very hot with embarrassment. They wave an electric device all over my stuff. Having, as usual, found nothing dangerous, they attempt to put my things back as they found them. But it's not possible to replicate the manner in which I pack my stuff or to restore my dignity. Exile and exclusion, home, October 5, 2001. News bulletin, reconstruction of the downtown area is being discussed. Who moves back? Who goes home? Who returns and who's left behind? Homeland, June 2001. Beirut is a city reconstructed with a beautiful, fashionable downtown. The Paris of the Orient is resurrected. Shatila is a crowded area of one square kilometers on which 17,000 people live and where expanding the living, livable space is not an option. To make space, people in Shatila buy air says Nuhad Hamad, the director of the Shatila Center for Social Development. I first dismiss what she says, but she repeats the same statement. It's very simple. There are more Palestinian people than land, to the extent that the only choice left for camp residents is to expand vertically, mm. buying a roof of a house and building another house on top of it. The geography of this position in action. The people of Shatila have nowhere to go. The only place that they want to go is home. Rabia Safuria is erased from the map, but you hold it tenderly in your heart. Your memories embrace it, refusing to let go. You'd like to go home, but the borders are close to there. Back home, Ju July 2001, we are walking toward the mass grave where most of the victims of the massacres are buried. Actually, I'm gonna skip this. Talk about it next week. Yeah. Okay. Home, October 25th, 2001. 478 people are confirmed dead at the World Trade Center. New York grieves for people with a mix of names, cultures, professions, lifestyles, religious beliefs, and family arrangements. Grieve, New York. Grieve. Grieve. Can you grieve for the Pakistani man who died in the INS detention center of a heart attack while awaiting deportation? Prisoners are not entitled to adequate health care. What does his family say or feel? Do we get to know? Grief for the Egyptian who moved to New York in search of a safer life, but found no peace of, man, of, of mind. Does he count? Grief for the West African who used to pray in the Bronx. Where can they hide? Grief for all those anonymous beings whose labor no one credits, names no one remembers, and bodies no one dares to claim. Grief for the mothers and fathers, the daughters and the sons, the lovers and the beloved, the friends and the co-workers. Grief for shattered dreams, for lives lost, for closed possibilities. Grief for a loss of human lives. Remember, remember New York. 
If I tell you about them, would you remember? Would you remember Iman Hajjo, the 15-month-old baby girl whose brains were splattered on the back seat of her father's car as he went looking for help? No hospital for Iman. No passing through checkpoints. The road situation is bad today. Grief for Muhammad al-Durra, a boy with a father who could not protect his son from death, the way fathers ought to do. Bullet after bullet after bullet ripped the boy. The father watches helpless, crying like a baby, a Palestinian Amadou Diallo. Grieve New York, search your heart. Is there a small spot there to grieve for all? Then grieve, if you will, for the Afghans, whose screams of hope no one seems to remember. Grieve. Where is home? I once believed that the restoration of my dignity was possible in New York. In theory, at least, people are supposed to be equal before the law. I'm not naive. I'm fully aware of the subtle and not so subtle systems of domination and discrimination. As we continue to be ethnically and racially profiled, thousands of Arabs, Arab Americans, Muslims, and Muslim Americans are feeling foreign at home. We do not feel we belong. We do not feel safe. Call it what you want. But the melting pot theory fails as America insists on grinding the coarse kernels of our food, refusing to name them what they are and accept them on their own terms. Garlicky, oniony, spicy, strong, and fulfilling. Beneath the facade of liberal multiculturalism lies an ethnocentric New York that continues to deny our existence, except as bloodthirsty and suspect male villains helpless female victims and exoticized alien others. Our cultures are erased. Our lives flattened to fit neatly in the fold of Americanness. No longer can we draw on New York's rich, vibrant, and diverse cultural scene. Red, white, and blue may be a safer blanket to some, but to the rest of us, they symbolize exclusion. Mm -hmm. Rationalizing exclusion is a band-aid solution to dull the pain. But when thousands are detained and thousands more are voluntarily coerced into interviews, New York and indeed the US feels suspicious like occupied Palestine. This is not Palestine where most are subject to misery and terror. As my mothers would say, but it doesn't apply here. We're very alone here. Our diasporic lives fragmented. Our souls bleed. It's perhaps time to go home. To where? Homeland erased, nowhere to go. Yet, Palestine fil qalb, Palestine in my heart, my father's sticker insists. This is a sticker that we had on the car, we removed it right around 9-11-2001. Memories of him, of my brother Amir, and of the land, green, dry, barren and mountainous, locked, loved garden, guarded. A secret, cheapened if shared, Palestine fil qalb. My father's sticker reminds me of a homeland erased. Return to sender, no such address exists, mm -hmm. but we insist, Palestine for Palm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we should go meta and do your reflections on your reflections. Because <laughs> okay. you commented earlier that, you know, I think the earliest publication was 2003. Yeah, uh, I began. Better. Yeah, yeah, I began writing this like right. I mean, maybe a week or two weeks after 9/11, 2001, mm -hmm. for a teaching at Hunter College, and then I did more for a teaching at CUNY Graduate Center. And I think, uh, okay, so one of the things that I'm actually very critical of myself is about the whole assimilation stuff. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like we feel safe or we don't feel safe, and so on. So I'm kind of like I think I'm presenting a very idealistic mm -hmm. image, and. I never thought that way. That wasn't. That weren't really my beliefs, but I think I was just trying to kind of like say something to reach people. It was sort of like a device to reach. And I'm. And I'm. I, at the time, I didn't think that. At the time, I was just writing. And I go through the whole thing about getting in the taxi driver, in the taxi, and then four businessmen jump in, and one of them is Iranian. And he has an accent, and I have an accent. But no, no, none of us out each other. We kind of like <laughs> don't say anything. So there is like a whole bunch of stuff that was going on, what was happening in 9-11 and 2001. So, but I think it's, I keep going back and forth about the ways in which um, a lot of the times we want to, we tend to tell stories 
in the US in particular in order to deliver a message. Mm -hmm. And when we use analysis, political analysis, people say it's too abstract, they don't understand. So they say like, simplify your story to, to fit the average mm -hmm. American. And the average American is George Moore, the beer summit mm -hmm. guy, you know, okay, who Obama invited to the White House to sit with, the, to sit with Skip Gates, who was stopped from his house in, in Harvard because the white policeman thought that he did not belong mm -hmm. to Harvard because how could a black man belong to Harvard? Mm -hmm. And so the president lost a, mo a teachable moment, mm -hmm. right, to, to, to engage in sort of like smoothing the edges and so on. So I think I want to, I, I, I really want to kind of like be more critical of how I've, I've written it and so on because maybe I was feeling at that particular moment safe, but I actually had not felt safe for a very long time in New York. So. I think it was sort of like, a lot of people were saying after 9-11-2001, you could not speak to anybody. You could not say anything. You could not talk about Arabs or Muslims. I mean, Palestine was being bombed every single day. It was, Palestine was closed. There was, because it was, this was the Aqsa Intifada going on. So there were a lot of trauma going on in Palestine. But we couldn't even in interject that kind of discussion because people were not willing to listen. And I'm not talking about the mainstream or the most right wing or the central or centrist or even left of center like let's say democratic party or something i'm talking about people who are supposed to be progressives mm -hmm. people did not want to hear they did not want to and every single time people will say they want to talk about anything evil they say bin laden and everybody's supposed to understand what you're talking right. about and i I'm, I'm, i had historically and i continue to have serious problems with bin laden i don't think that he should have assassinated the way he should if you have problem bring him to due process okay but uh, it became synonymous when I mean, you say Osama, you say Bin Laden, you say a few things that everybody is supposed to understand what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So Arabness, Muslimness, Palestinianness, mm -hmm. all of it becomes equal mm -hmm. to things that, so in that kind of, I mean, I understand what I was doing, but if I were going to do it again, I will definitely, I will definitely write it very, very differently. And I would not, because here I'm talking about Amadou Diallo, I'm talking about Mohammed Dura, I'm talking about all of the stuff that's going on. And I was very much involved in anti-racist organizing in New York. And, but at the same time, when I was speaking, I was kind of like trying to reach maybe imaginary audience. So I think, yeah, so, yeah. And I think also as feminists also, I sort of, this whole thing of kind of like, talk about individualized self and so on is mm -hmm. problematic. But so I, I don't know. This is what I think. So from start, yeah. Did you comment that you were really safe? And I'm gonna. Oh, I'm gonna start. Sorry, I'm not. Yeah. not <laughs> oh, well, I haven't been in this country that as long. I arrived in 2007. I'm from Barcelona, Catalan. So I was not here when. 11 happened. My partner, uh, Natalia, who's Argentinian, was at the time married with a Muslim. Uh, and they were living in New York, so she was from Bengal. And she saw exactly what you're describing. It was like, and, and the fact that she's white and uh, you know, she's Argentina, she looks at white. I mean, the, in the street. She could pass. Yeah. Oh, but in the street, they will think they will uh, stop them. Is yeah. this guy har harassing you? It's like, it, mm. it was this kind of <laughs> like, like it was an unbelievable. Yeah thing, uh, but um, one thing I, I've been thinking lately about what you said that the public is too narrow, mm. right? The, yeah. What happens to the public sphere when these uh, acts happen, that suddenly things shrink and then there is this like silence that as you say, they're not, it's not a silence that is imposed by the government like in a dictatorship, you would yeah. say, but mm. that suddenly people switch and go into this fear climate. Mm -hmm. And these I have experienced in the U.S. and I have never experienced before. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I lived in different countries. I lived in Spain, in France for five years, in Argentina for a year and a half. And I never have, I mean, I, this sense where people shut down very quickly because there is something we don't need to talk about because they're terrified mm -hmm. that something is going to happen to them. And, I, you know, the thing I've been trying to learn, I mean, I think that comes from Macartism, right? Mm -hmm. Like what yeah. happened, like it's, and then, and then, you know, like, Macartism for me is not, it is a form of fascism inside yeah. mm -hmm. of a democracy. And I think what's something that is very particular about American society 
is that we usually think of fascism as like a fascist party that takes power and mm -hmm. changes the political regime. And the more I've been learning about the history of this country and studying to educate myself, I've come to realize that the specificity about the United States and its imperialist model is that this society, especially the two democratic parties, the Republican and Democratic, they tolerate fascism. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, McCarthy was appointed, and when his job was done, he was kicked out. Mm -hmm. And everything, and nobody said there was a regime change. In Nobody said, like, when McCarthy was in power, we were not living under democracy. Like, it was a, and so I'm just saying there is this, um, Normalization. There is this new form of how, like, uh, forms of fascism, because fascism is not just someone who has right-wing ideas or Nazi ideas. It's a transformation of civil society, right? Mm -hmm. Like the correct, the difference between having far-right groupings <laughs> and, and say we're living in a fascist society. Is in a fascist society you have groups that are organized and attacking, and society becomes polarized, and a big part of the society starts believing in these ideas and implementing them. And so I feel like we are, it's a little bit in the DNA of this modern society, um, the tendency towards this fascist attitude. And I experienced this in this university um, around um, the campaign to, to defend it, right? Mm -hmm. Like the fact that suddenly you put your finger on someone you cannot, something you cannot talk about, and then you see like people are freaking out. Like, you cannot talk about this, you need to leave this alone, you're gonna lose your job. Like everybody, like is this kind of like, this climate of fear, maybe because I wasn't raised in this country, I was able to just say, well, <laughs> if you don't wanna do that, like I, I know where I stand, I know what I believe, and I'm not afraid. I mean, things could happen to me, but mm -hmm. I'm not afraid the way you're afraid, because you don't even know who you are. Because this is kind of fear, where people, like you ask where is home, but to some degree, the Americans that live in this fear, they don't have home either. Mm -hmm. Like they don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. In the sense they are they are possessed in habit by this fear that is latching on different but they they cannot stand on a firm ground and say yes to this, no to that. Mm -hmm. They are completely I mean you see the nationalism, the blindness, like they're they're so manipulable <laughs> mm -hmm. that I wonder if they if they, they think they have a ground to stand on. But I don't think they do have a ground to stand on, to say yes or no to something, you know. So, you know, I, to this degree, I, I'm very happy to still remain foreign to this culture. <laughs> but uh, I might become a citizen, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> 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 but I don't know, what, let's see what you think of this question of what is home and how you perceive this. And any other question about the nation, yeah. yeah. Before I get to that question, just listening to your piece, I couldn't help but to also think about where I was and who I was then too. This is like young 13 year old. Oh, you're so young. A little baby. <laughs> <laughs> a little baby. Yeah. Um, as you know, the 9 11 happened, and you know, I grew up in South Central Los Angeles, you know, poor, working class family. My parents, you know, don't, they aren't reading the news, they're not, they, you know, they have an elementary school education, it's not like they know where is what outside of our home. So for me, 9-11 and seeing my parents' reaction to 9-11 and to anti-Arab racism was very interesting because it would just became normal to, to kind of fear you know, this other, this other religion, and this other, you know, like, uh, who are these people, and we're scared of them. Mm -hmm. We don't know who they are, but we're scared of them. In relationship to that moment, a month after, um, there was a novella, a soap opera, that was one of the most popular soap operas throughout Latin America at, at the time, called El Clon. Oh. And I've been meaning to watch it because it has somebody with a hijab on it. Oh, there's so many yeah, okay. uh, <laughs> women with hi hijabs yeah. on, you know. Um, and so this popular novella that I watched and loved that was so orientalist and I repented my sins <laughs> <laughs> for loving this novella um, was a really problematic uh, representation that was also a, a conversation piece for a lot of poor women of color who speak Spanish who watch this novella. 
This is why belly dancing became so popular, even within the context of 9-11. Um, in LA, throughout the US, throughout Latin America, at the same time that there was so much fear, there was so much like exotification, exotic, like representation through you know Orientalist images and tropes of like the hijabi woman, you need to be free and have her love, uh, who's non-Muslim, and this novella is Brazilian and dubbed in Spanish. Mm. But there was all, all these conversations around around that about like, oh, that's Islam, you know, that's that's what that is, and and this novella is kind of educating, you know, these mostly women, women of color, are watching it, while at the same time, all this fear mongering. So it's very interesting. I, it just reminded me of that. I've never kind of reflected on that until right now, actually. Um, I hope maybe someone's written on that, but it's. It was different no, from my experience. Nobody, like, <laughs> <so we> can. <laughs> I'll watch yeah. the novella again. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's very interesting what it meant for me to grow up a second generation Central American in the context of 9-11 and, and what my entry point was to understand or just start understanding because I was never educated in school, yeah, yeah. anything related to the Arab world, nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, there's, mm -hmm. that was my window that orientalist soap opera. I was thinking about three things that you were saying and maybe we can have a discussion about them. One is this whole, like the, the Trump tweets mm -hmm. about uh, the members of uh, quote unquote the squad. Mm -hmm. Well actually the squad, without quote unquote, they call mm -hmm. themselves the squad. So um, the four uh, women, Congress women of color, and the whole emphasis on how that the three of, three of them were born in the U.S. and Ilhan Omar was one who was born outside of the U.S. But she actually qualifies for being an American because she was very young when she came. And she, she had enough time to decontaminate herself mm. from the soilness of foreignness, right? And become what is supposed to be an American. So like the whole media is like going over backwards to say whether people born and so on. But people are not talking about what does, what does it mean when you say go home? Mm -hmm. And who is it said to? Mm -hmm. And who says it? Mm -hmm. Who actually feels that they have the right to say? Mm -hmm. And who is, whom is it directed uh, against? And I know that for me, I mean, I would, I would just pass, but then I'll go to get my ID at NYU, and all of a sudden people will get Abdel Hadi, things change. Mm -hmm. I go to the train station, people like all of a sudden I get doubly uh, profiled. Mm -hmm. Okay, at the airport, Jaime That's and I travel, my bags are always searched. His bags are never searched. We're traveling together on the, like the same itinerary. Like we always have the sticker, and I always have the gift. I always have the gift that my bags have been, regardless where they are. So there is this whole constant stuff that is going on all the time, and the ways in which certain foreigners mm -hmm. get um, vilified and others. The other thing I was thinking about is that. You know the, the the whole question of Salvador and Palestine, mm -hmm. because in 1986, the uh, the Los Angeles Eight were attacked. The Palestinians, the seven Palestinians, and one Kenyan uh, wife of one of them, and the reason they were attacked by the INS and uh, what is it? Inter, inter, immigration and naturalization, immigration service. naturalization service. The former ICE. They were targeted because at that time the Reagan administration has failed to target CISPES, the Committee in Solidarity mm -hmm. with the People of El Salvador. Mm -hmm. They really tried to crush it because there was a huge movement mm -hmm. against US intervention in Central America, mm -hmm. against the Death Squad, against the Contras. It was huge. They tried to target CISPES. They tried to target FDR, FMLN, the liberation mm -hmm. movement, and they failed because mm -hmm. there was a lot of support in the US. A huge movement, including now the current mayor of New York, mm -hmm. was supposedly one of the people who visited Nicaragua. It didn't learn anything, but you know, not everybody passes the grade, so <laughs> or, uh, as we know, right? But uh, but they they targeted the, the, the and when we found out out later is that they targeted the Palestinians because they thought the Palestinians were the weakest link. Mm -hmm. That if they get to prosecute the Palestinians, then they can go after the rest of the movement, mm -hmm. right? And that is that's what they did, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's very very interesting that connection that was going on. Because what happened then, a whole bunch of groups, in, especially in California, La Raza, mm -hmm. Legal Defense, a whole bunch of groups, the Japanese in particular, Japanese communities embraced mm -hmm. the Palestinians. The community itself, the Palestinian community, got into three buses and went to the, to the, to the detention center. They refused to be afraid because what the Reagan administration was trying is to have a chilling effect. Mm -hmm. 
silence people. So then they thought they'll isolate these people and then everybody else will crumble. Instead, people from the community got on buses and went to the, to the detention center in order to support and raise money to have the legal defense and so on and so forth. And it, was, it became a huge movement to the point that it forced a whole bunch of people in the civil liberties movement from ACLU to editors in the New York Times to even Nightline and so on to actually speak about the LAA case. It became a test case mm. for the government's prosecution and targeting and so on. And so there was like a, a shift at that time that, that changed things. But the last thing I would say is about what's going on. Like you know, have you have the go home, you have the whole question which Omar was talking about earlier about the contamination of Baltimore mm -hmm. also at that time. I mean, the racism, the thing is, is that I think it's really important for us to think about it, yeah. To think about it as part of a package. That's not, not to, how do we think about them as connected with each other? And how do we think about them as separate? And I'm going back to the, your earlier conversation. Is that Trump calls Baltimore rat, uh, rat infested. Mm -hmm. He talks about um, Haiti and African countries as quote unquote shithole countries, right? Uh, and then uh, there is all this kind of targeting about Mexicans are rapists. Mm -hmm. You know, people who are coming here are invading the country. Mm -hmm. The El Paso shooter says that invasion, 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 his manifesto mm -hmm. repeats the stuff that the, 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 the president of the White House is talking about. And then just to bring it to what, what uh, Blanca was talking about, I've had several um, racist uh, emails, including the death threat that I've received in mid-August, that actually reproduce the same thing. They tell me to go home. They say that there will be ethnic cleansing of Muslims in this Christian country. They say, they call, they say shithole Muslim. They call Muz even, shithole Muz. Mm -hmm. okay. They repeat all of these things that are kind of like, you know, coming and and this is, so to me, this is part of the racist discourse that we are, and it's very interesting because Jack Shaheen, when he talks about Timothy McVeigh, he doesn't say white. Mm -hmm. He actually says Irish Catholic. Mm -hmm. Because at that time when Jack Shaheen made the film Real Bad Arabs, it wasn't, people were not talking about wi whiteness and white uh, supremacy or white nationalism. They were only talking about kind of people, like which people, people, right? When they say people, you know they're talking about white people, right? And so it's very, very interesting, but to kind of like think about it, so what do we need? How is it that we can take this whole climate of fear, and it's intended, it's mm -hmm. all intentional, of course, and it has a personal toll on you, but how do we take it and, and transform it into ways in which for us to say no, mm -hmm. just no. I, at one point there was a movement, actually people who refused to invasion of Nicaragua, it was called Refuse and Resist. Mm -hmm. Remember, and like they took the pledge against the Nicaragua invasion when the Iran Contra affair was actually before the Iran Contra affair became. So, how is it that we actually can can how can we challenge the environment? Of, and I'm not I'm not talking about like moving directly immediately now to organizing and so on because we we had time to. So, but I'm thinking about how do we do that? What is it necessary for us to switch in our minds? This kind of like uh, this tunnel vision, mm -hmm. the ways in which we get, we sort of get presented with a very narrow space and we accept it. Mm -hmm. Like, how is it that we can think more beyond, challenge the boundaries that not only the, 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 the direct people who'd like to oppress us are doing in terms of practice, pra mm -hmm. practices, but also the discursive and the imaginations, our own minds that are getting locked. And we are not allowed to think about it. So we construct things as foreign and domestic. I mean, as if kind of like the US has ever respected the borders. Like mm -hmm. everybody else is supposed to respect the border, but the very people who are calling themselves the policemen of the world are actually policing mm -hmm. everything else, every single border we have. The other question is actually it makes me think about, about like the whole question of the ethnic studies curriculum in California mm. and how it was also targeted. I think partly, of course, it's targeted because of racist reasons, okay? It's also targeted because it mentions Palestine. Mm -hmm. It's targeted because it refuses exceptionalizing certain things and it actually says this is all connected and we are not, we're going to actually go and fulfill the spirit of 68. What people in 68 struck an organ, they, so they are, 
They're trying to place boundaries, and we are saying, no, no, we're not going to subject ourselves to boundaries. And what happens here, what happens across the border, because we actually are not accepting the colonial border. We're mm -hmm. saying this problem with them. We're challenging all of this stuff. How do we do that in terms of academic knowledge and mm -hmm. the epistemic knowledge and the way we think about things? I mean, this is kind of like, it's, it, there is multiple borders that are imposed upon us. So, you know, like when you were talking about the four borders, but also the borders between Mexico and Central mm -hmm. America, so who created all mm -hmm. these borders? Mm -hmm. Why are there all these borders anyway? What happened in 1492? Mm -hmm. What happened after 1492? Mm -hmm. And how is that connected? And last semester, last year, actually, Blanca came and spoke to us about the Spanish Civil War and mm -hmm. the Republican spirit and the, the, the struggle against fascism and the whole Catalan and the Basque. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, it was, by the way, it is on, on, on Ahmed. So all the great knowledge we produce is preserved for people to learn about it. <laughs> but you think about like what's so what's the connection? Mm -hmm. What's the connection between 1492 mm -hmm. and where people were actually what were they doing? Why is it that there was the whole Republican spirit in the in Andalusia? I mean, what was going on? What were people doing? Is there some kind of connection? Is there no connection between historical amnesia, corrective amnesia and so on? How but how is it we connect the words with each other and reject this kind of like segmentation that says this is where you are? And I'm don't mean conflicting you know things because I do believe like people are saying no mixi, no borders, mm -hmm. they're speaking from the US. Mm -hmm. They're not speaking from mm -hmm. you know, and then what Homa was talking about, mm -hmm. the ways in which Kashmir people would actually like exactly. to have borders and which the young kid Palestinian child in a Palestinian refugee camp says, no, we actually would like to have some sovereignty. Mm -hmm. We'd like to be able to determine our, I mean, so there is like all these things, there is this whole question about things that are happening and also the ways in which boundaries are. And so I, I'm, I'm, you know, yeah. Well, I have a question, if I can, um, to, the, to, to the panel and to the, to the, um, to the participants. class and every, everybody. So, I mean, this week is titled uh, Settling Colonialism indigeneity and genocide, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the, you know, we have, uh, I just wanna, some of the required readings this week include Audra Simpson's work on uh, Mohawk Interruptus, specifically your chapter on indigenous interruptions, Mohawk nationhood, citizenship in the state. We also have um, Emmerman Bonds, uh, Penny John, uh, no, sorry, Johnson John and, um, sorry, Penny oh, Johnson and alive. John yeah. Rupert, yeah, and my roots are still alive, specifically the chapter on building the Jewish state. Mm -hmm. And then we also have Elo Shahat's work on what is Eurocentrism. Mm -hmm. And I think you're reading your excerpt from Where is Home, I really want to unpack the significance of what, what, what do you mean by home, right? And so, I mean, when we're talking about diaspora studies, mm -hmm. a lot of times home is an overused trope. Mm -hmm. Right, and so what do we mean by that? Mm -hmm. And like, also, what do we mean by the scales of home? Right, mm -hmm. because we're kind of oscillating across this. Sometimes mm -hmm. we're talking about home in its kind of domesticated sense of like understanding home as like bounded of like mm -hmm. you know extended family and stuff like that, and also but also being rooted in place. Mm -hmm. But you also talked about home when you're talking about the squad in the sense of like home is like a national consciousness, mm -hmm. right? Like, under your setting yourself as being part of the nation state, if you want to mm -hmm. think, imagine mm -hmm. communities with Benedict Anderson, which we were yeah. referencing mm -hmm. earlier, right. And so it's, it's across multiple scales, but also the fact that Professor um, Blanco was talking about of what is the necessity of belonging and how do we embrace those tensions mm -hmm. of, 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 not, of, of, of not belonging, but not, as you were saying, kind of the striving towards belonging, mm -hmm. but, uh, but embracing those, those tensions of, of, of unsettledness, but not in the sense of displacement, but in the sense of like, of an understanding that we are not safe under the apparatus of a police state, that we are not safe under the apparatus of a set of colonial regime, right? And that we are not safe under, you know, the confines of capitalism and, and racial, you know, racial capitalism. Mm -hmm. And so like, what, what does that mean? What does it mean to consistently engage on a quest of home um, when those are made, you know, um, on many different scales inaccessible, right? Whether it be in terms of uh, questions of incarceration, internment, mm -hmm. um, but also of the denial of sovereignty, right? Um, so I don't know, it's just, I'm thinking about what what do we mean by home? I might be thinking a lot about, uh, what, who's the song who says, this land is your land? Oh, God. Oh. Yeah. Woody, uh, 
Where you got this? Yeah. This land is your land. Like, that you'd be stopping land that is not yours to somebody else. <laughs> yeah. like, what are the indigenous people? I mean, what's wrong with you? Yeah. But yeah. it's it's kind of like also what's her name? What's the name of Jane Austen? Is she said like my country is the world or something like this? There is. I mean, I think so. It raises the question of what does what does nationalism say, mean, mm-hmm. and what what does nationalism mean when you actually have a colonizing and what as anti-colonial nationalism. Mm-hmm. And to me, I, I always think about it in terms of, at least in terms of Palestine. Mm-hmm. So it's always for me tentative. It's kind of like tentative belonging because it is tentative until you are able to get liberated. Mm-hmm. And then when you start pushing for that, so it's okay. So the Palestinian flag, for example, has been historically a flag of liberation. People lost their lives when they hoisted it on the electric poles when they wore it on their t-shirts, it would earn you six months in prison. I mean, this people, this happened. Okay, so then, after Oslo, when I went to uh, Palestine the first time, and I saw the Palestinian flag in the border in Jericho, I was so excited. But then I got on the bus, and there is this young man next to me, and I said, oh my God, we were dealing with two checkpoints, now we have three. Okay, so now we don't have only Israel and Jordan, now we have the Palestinian Authority also <laughs> stopping us, and so on. Yeah. And then I'm sitting next to uh, this very amazing uh, organizer in Nablus and for an event, and then they start playing the Palestinian national anthem, which they removed, it used to be Fida'i, which means freedom mm-hmm. fighter, they removed it, it's mm-hmm. like no more, they don't, it's the only now music, or they say Biladi, my home mm-hmm. land, so like all of this other stuff, the resistance is gone. But then they host the flag, and she wouldn't get up, and I'm like saying, aren't you gonna get up? Like, we're all supposed to send, she's like, I'm not signing up for a flag that's sewn in the settlements. Mm. So like, there are some factories in the settlements sewing the flag. So what does the flag mean? And this is always when people like hoist the American flag again and again and again. And, and Trump curses Kaepernick for, for like taking a knee and, and protesting what does the flag mean. Mm-hmm. And people are like, what is it about the flag today? Like, who's, who's taking anything away from you? I mean, just like keep your, your offenses of the... So there is this kind of like tentativeness. To me, it's tentativeness of being part of a community mm. as long as that participation in a particular belonging or a home or feeling at home in a particular, that's always tentative. That is also part of a bigger world. That's kind of like part of, a, of, a, of an international, if you will. And I don't want to only say transaction. I'm talking mm-hmm. about international as well, okay? Mm. And, and to refer to the internationalism that we are part of that, this is the way I think about it, that is, there is, there is this, the, the specificity of the struggle for justice in Fort Palestine, but that specificity is always tempered by the indivisibility, of, always, 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 always. And if we lose sight of that, and we only think about Palestine, we don't think about the rest of it, we're missing the boat. I mean, I'm, and I really believe we're missing the boat. We're missing the boat intellectually. We're missing the boat in terms of what we're trying to talk about and theorize and teach about. We're missing the boat in, ter- in the boat in terms of changing the world. I mean, I really, I think we're, we will, we will not, we're not going to succeed. So we really need to. So to me, it's very, very tentative. So I'm, um, yeah. For me, I do feel at home in Palestine transnationally imagined. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily where in certain places in Palestine I feel at home. Certain places I don't feel at home at all. I feel very alienated. Mm-hmm. And in certain places in the U.S. I feel at home. In some places I don't feel at home. Like here, mm-hmm. I'm sitting with all of you here. I'm feeling at home. Mm-hmm. If you are not all here and I'm walking out in the, and I start looking over my shoulder because there are serious threats that are out there that potentially could be lodged into danger. Mm-hmm. So I do need to watch out for this. And I expect everybody else who's part of my community's home to be protective of me, to actually shield me. Mm-hmm. And, take, and I expect that. And I don't expect that as a charity. And I don't expect that people to be nice, to be supportive. Because I will also have everybody's back mm-hmm. all the time. I would never give up on that. And, and it's not because I have every reserve people have to have it, because I think there is a principle about this indivisibility of justice that kind of like, don't sell me. Don't sell me BS and say, oh, this is because of this and that. It's like, okay, go tell that to somebody else. Don't tell it to me. So I think this is, I think I see it that way. So I'm kind of like, there is a moment for anti colonial if you want to talk about, because people talk about nationalism a lot these days. And this is like one of my areas of research. Mm-hmm that there is tentativeness to anti-colonial nationalism that always has to be tempered mm. by internationalism. Mm. That cannot be on its own. 
and cannot be I'm only going to care for myself, my community, and myself. If you want to think about Benedict Anderson's model of imagined communities, then it's a broader imagined community. It's not just a particular whatever you call yourself. You know, so. I mean, I just just to respond just really quickly is that, I, and I'd like to respond as well, is that that's that same discourse that I feel is co-opted by the oppressors and the colonizers, right? And they, they engage this discourse of like feeling like they belong, right? Whether it be in Tel Aviv or Israel or they belong in New York or they feel like they belong. You know, like how many times do we hear people who are descendants of settlers say that they're native to San Francisco, or the, right. right? Yeah. So like it's the same sort of discourse. I'm like, oh, you're from the other nation? I did not know that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's just some of the things that I'm weary about is kind of like censoring the, um, a discourse of belonging because when we say like, because it, it's not just about, and you're not saying this, but I think that we need to be able to confront kind of this very um, kind of liberal discourse that we see, that we hear oh, just about. Sorry, the book is called yeah. Three Guineas yeah. by Jane Austen, I think. It's Three, yeah, I'm yeah but I'm mean, just, you know what you're saying? Like a lot of people yeah. try to crush the discussions about like a radical politic or like a revolutionary struggle by saying that like, but my feelings, right? I feel like I belong here. Like okay. how many times, I mean, in, in my organizing spaces with the Zionists, they try to stop conversation by saying that for many Jews, Zionism is an integral right. part of our identity. Right. And they're trying to use it to, they're trying to deploy that to stop conversation. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing, like, mm -hmm. like you know, we were we, teaching Palestine had a delegation uh, in, a, in South Africa. And how, you know, these, the, you know and the, the whole debates about, like, settlement and, like, post-apartheid of, like, well, that a lot of, a lot of the, the descendants of the white settlers, and they're settlers themselves now, they're saying that they belong there, right? And so like, and it, it's just this sort of discourse that gets co-opted by the colonizers and that I just, I wanted to unpack and kind of out it is that it's not the same, right? It's not the same this, of, of, the, of this question of the belonging that we're raising in these spaces, but it's co-opted. It's the same language. It's the same words that they're using. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is a very complicated question, the question of belonging. I mean, it's very complicated for me <laughs> yeah. um, because I have less and less of a feeling of belonging to anywhere, of yeah. having a home. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, I I, I do understand um, the desire of belonging, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, my people, if you want to say that, uh, Catalan people have awakened in a very strong fever of belonging <laughs> yeah. uh, since 2000. 2017, yeah. right? And I don't share the desire they mm. do have. Um, I don't feel it, uh, but I deeply understand it. Mm. And so, um, so maybe there's two things. One thing is, yes, I agree with what you're saying, Rabab, that you know the question of this, the difference between the oppressed nationalism and the oppressor nationalism, mm. and and I think that. Um, we and sometimes people say, well, what, why are you a Catalan nationalist? Shouldn't we all be? Shouldn't we abolish borders, right? Like mm -hmm. you know, like yeah. like oh my God, like you want even a tiny country? Like shouldn't mm -hmm. be internationalist? And I think it's very important for us to to remember that the internationalism we're talking about um, is a, a process of a voluntary undoing yeah. of mm -hmm. nationalism mm -hmm. uh, that can only happen once uh, the desire of belonging has been acknowledged. And has been uh, uh, implemented, mm -hmm. and I think, of course, of the example of the Soviet Union, because I don't think it's an accident that the most powerful anti-imperialist thinking came from the fact that the Soviet government undid the Russian Empire mm -hmm. and gave the right of self-determination to the oppressed nations as a condition to talk about internationalism. Right? The internationalism began by the undoing of the empire and the recognition of the right of self-determination. And if you don't have that, you have no internationalism. And the idea that we will have a shortcut and just like move to just abolish everything mm -hmm. without doing the uh, work of undoing the empire, yeah. I think that's that's one of the shortcuts that we both want to take. Uh, and now we need to say no, right? Mm -hmm. So both in the case of Catalonia, Palestine, I think that there is a desire of belonging that we need to um, respect and enact. Mm -hmm. And then the question comes about how do we feel about these things, right? Because, for <laughs> example, I defend 
the right of Catalan people to have a referendum of self-determination, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I do not say I'm a Catalan nationalist. Uh, if pressed by uh, a bigot from Madrid, I would say, yes, I'm a Catalan nationalist, mm -hmm. right? But if I'm asked to, who I'm, I'm a socialist. Mm -hmm. I'm a revolutionary socialist. That's why, I mean, if you ask me, say who you are in one, in one word, I'm not gonna say, but depends in my context, I'm gonna yeah. say yeah. something yeah. different, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I think that becomes a problem of rooting ourselves in our subjective experiences, mm -hmm. right? Because we've seen this, like, you know, that of course, like now Zionism is the, the movement of liberation of the oppressed Jews, <laughs> and like everybody feels they belong. Like, and I do think that the um, the question of I think there is a way to respond to that to say, okay, so I will acknowledge you're right, but first you need to acknowledge mine. Right? I think that a lot of the um, Jews who say, well, I belong here, say, okay, but will you recognize that I belong here too? Mm -hmm. And will you take the necessary steps to make that recognition? Because up to, until now, your existence is predicated upon the negation of our belonging to this land. And so if you want me to recognize that you belong to this land too, you need to start by recognizing that I belong to this land too, which means concretely dismantling the state of apparatus mm -hmm. that is negating us. Because I think that, that you know, like this, we are locked into this individual thing of our experiences and our emotions. And so then all our points of view are valid and how can you argue with someone's feelings and this person thinks they belong, so who are you to tell them they don't belong to the land? And then, so then we need to prove like some historic data or archive who's mm -hmm. here being like, then we go into this, that, that's a never ending discussion, right? Because the question of home is a political question, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so we need to say, okay, there is a sentiment feeling, but the question of, does everyone have a right to have a home? Mm -hmm. And um, the fact that this right is denied, you know, is a question of a relation of power, you know, like the fact that Catalan people cannot even ask the question. Mm -hmm. It's very, it, they mm -hmm. cannot ask the question. It's illegal, unconstitutional for Catalans to have a referendum to ask a question if they want separation. It's insane. It's unconstitutional to ask a question. It's unconstitutional, illegal for Palestinians to envision that they will have a state of their own, they will mm -hmm. take the land, they've always been there. It's inimaginable. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there, of course, from this violence comes a desire. Mm -hmm. um, I like to believe that when this desire is honored, it could be superseded. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like to believe that. Uh, because I feel like in this is like with many of our other needs, right? When we feed our needs, <laughs> when we're not hungry, we can eat, we're not thinking of food every day. <laughs> but when we're kept hungry, we're just like seeing, doing all the possible schemes. I see that with the, the students in this university who are hungry and homeless. Mm -hmm. And I know in class, I feel it, that most of their mental energy is trying to figure out how they're gonna eat, where they're gonna sleep, mm -hmm. how they're gonna afford transportation, can they buy the books? That's where, that's where their, their, their soul is because if their needs were met, I don't think they would be very much interested in being occupied or preoccupied in feeding themselves, <laughs> like, and housing them. And I think with this question of belonging, is a little bit um, a desire that once it's honored and, and materialized, not just put in paper, I think it's this question of belonging can become be discussed in different terms that are not terms of borders. And, mm -hmm. But up to now, have we reached this point? Can I just say something before we mm -hmm. go? Uh, the reason this belonging, actually, in this book, is because the American Studies Association conference mm. in 2003, the title was uh, something and belonging. Mm -hmm. You know, about uh, mm -hmm. that Amy Kaplan was the president, and mm -hmm. there was, you know, she was working on the anarchy of empire and so on. And there was this big discussion Iraq mm -hmm. invasion was about to happen and so on. So there was this big discussion going on. So we, this is where we started. Mm -hmm. We started doing a two panels and we started talking about them and there was the discussion. So this is why, where it came from. It came from people who were saying, do they belong or do they not belong? To me, I don't really care. People belong, like why, who cares whether you feel belonging? I mean, this is, the belonging itself, this whole kind of psychic mm -hmm. state, it's not, for me, it's immaterial. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not really an issue. Mm -hmm. But that's where it came from. But I think, like with the Zionists, the whole question of it, is that it also negates other Jewish yes. mm -hmm. perspectives. And the Palestinians have saw that a long time ago. They said, they didn't say, that you, you, you come, you settle, and so on. Nobody said you have to all leave. In fact, okay, we can all live with each other. That's also unacceptable, like a complete negation mm -hmm. of this sort of like very exclusivist vision. You know, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you.
<laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I, I think for me, belonging, being and longing to belong, it's very, it, it is complicated. And I also think about the, the perspective of land and water mm-hmm. and where can folks be and who has been in those lands and waters and have, you know, story and ceremony and people then move and have story and set ceremony somewhere else with different lands and rivers and different waters and then what happens when certain folks aren't supposed to be there mm-hmm. and the land actually doesn't want you to be there or mm-hmm. the waters actually don't want you to be there and I think about um, I remember seeing someone post around the intense heat um, and sunburn that Israelis have experienced mm-hmm. um, and like high cancer rates skin cancer rates it's like yes the land doesn't right you don't belong in that land mm-hmm. Um, you're too pale, you <laughs> go away. <laughs> and so I think about land and, and water and who knows what the stories of those lands and those waters are and who has been sustained by those lands and those waters and how can we think about forming social relations outside of the confines of the nation state with folks who know land and water in a certain location. And I think about in San Diego, um, there was a, a welcoming of a lot of Syrian refugee families by Kumeyaay Nation Mm -hmm. who said, and and there was a whole ceremony around their welcoming, like, welcome to our lands. We hope that it feeds you. We hope that it sustains you. This is ours, and now it's yours too. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that moment was really powerful because it wasn't the United States speaking. It was not, you know, here are the government papers that allow you to be here. This is my ancestral homeland. Mm -hmm. It's Kumeyaay welcoming you make this your home too Mm -hmm. and i think there is where i really understood what it means to decenter the nation states and form your social relations beyond the nation states that can be foundations for dismantling the nation state or the need for borders or the need to have fear for repatriation of indigenous land because a lot of people think about what does that look like even for people of color settler poc to think about repatriating you know ohlone territory um and it always goes back to, well, who do you know? Do you not know anyone that's Ohlone? Yeah. That's an issue. Yeah. Um, and where are our relations that continue to can continue to decenter mm-hmm. the, the state? So I, to me, I have a lot of hope because there's so many, right now, at least the border region that I know most, um, different diasporic communities who we've been forming relations with, with the Kumeyaay Nation, and it's, it's powerful. It's powerful to imagine together what it means to work together to repatriate. Um, materially, mm-hmm. and, and that's hard, but yeah. And you know, you said something earlier about um, people who move from one place to the other, mm-hmm. kind of like, so now the border is preventing them. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking a lot about uh, specifically the Nakop communities mm-hmm. in Palestine, mm-hmm. the ways in which, um, you know, they're referred to as Bedouins, but mm-hmm. that's not, like, but how they refer to themselves, even when they say Badu. It is not the same way that they are that the same mm-hmm. word means when they are referred to right. as Bedouins mm-hmm. by the anthropologists or the state of Israel or anyone else that actually they consider Bedouins a particular species of Palestinians, mm. which is, I mean, I just, yeah. and and the ways in which they move I mean, and we've met with a lot of people in Nakab on mm-hmm. multiple uh, delegations. The people move from one place to the other, but they are also in particular place. Mm-hmm that they consider their sovereignty, if you will, Mm -hmm. their access to be able to graze, Mm -hmm. to graze their cattle, Mm -hmm. to be able to set up, to be able to have access to water there Mm -hmm. and so on, and not to be moved, Mm -hmm. not to be forced Mm -hmm. to move from one place to the other. This is kind of like where they're at, and they don't really want to, and and the Israeli government tried to move them away to another place, to displace another community, Mm -hmm. and they said, no, we don't want to. We don't want to be part of that. And there is this kind of like what you're talking about, the Kumia people. We were, we, we were in Hawaii about to, for the Native American Indigenous Studies Association. We went to visit with communities. And before you get into anywhere, like somebody from the community, and we were, um, we, we were going with a professor who was very much involved in Mauna Kea mm-hmm. struggle. So he would go first mm-hmm. and talk to the people who, whose community it is. And he says, we're coming here. We want to visit you, would you welcome us? And then the people from the community will say, you are welcome. So we're actually going there because we are 
accepted mm -hmm. by the people who are hosting and we are not being imposed upon the particular community. And it reminds me of like in Arabic we say ahlan wa sahlan. Mm -hmm. And it means that you halaltum ahlan wa wata'tum sahlan. It's actually you became family. Because mm -hmm. ahlan means family, kin. Mm -hmm. And so people say ahlan wa sahlan, but actually means you became family. Mm -hmm. And you got, you, 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 you visited our plains. Because sahlan means plains, because this is where the green is. And this is not the place which is you cannot drink and so on. So actually, it, and people don't know that, right? Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't, they don't. Uh, but it's actually basically says you became kin. We're actually welcoming you as kin, and you you are part of our plans. But we're actually not don't own it because mm -hmm. there is. It's most of the ownership is actually communal. It's mm -hmm. not there is no. And as they said, exactly. produce, and we say Pro you produce, exactly. you produce also. You want to produce, you produce as well, but. It is kind of like, this is where they, people go move around and they graze their cattle and they live around and so on. And now this, this foreign entity comes and wants to displace them. Mm -hmm. So there is this kind of like very interesting way. And then when you talk to people, they think, oh, this is too idealistic. Oh, you talk about utopian community. Oh, come on, don't give me this. And I mean, really, like this mm -hmm. is, this is, people dismiss it that as Blanca was, you know, you're saying about something in another context like, very dismissive of the kind of arguments you make. Because ah, it will never work out. I'm talking, why? I mean, you make you make co co you make imperialism and colonialism and settler colonialism work for quite a while. Why you think this actually much more equitable, mm -hmm. much more fair, much more um, um, non-imposing mm -hmm. way of having human relations? Why do you think it doesn't work? Why is yours work? Because you do it by the by the power of the sword or the power of the gun. Or, and why wouldn't this work? Mm -hmm. You know, like why isn't it a more humane way of actually relating to each other? Mm -hmm. So I think it's also the whole question of kind of like again, I want to just keep keep. I don't want to lose sight of the con concept of borders mm -hmm. and boundaries, the ways in which boundaries and borders are even imposed upon us not to be able to imagine mm -hmm. much more, much more liberating mm -hmm. belonging to a, like you know. The, the, the earth, the humanity, other people, relations, you know, the environment mm -hmm. in a way that's very different than the very oppressive mm -hmm. mechanism that we've been kind of like being able to imagine, being able to free our minds from this kind of like. Yeah, we've had conversation with a couple of folks in, in, in SD in San Diego about the fact that the land knows that these borders don't belong, especially when, in one of the pictures, right, like the border goes into the ocean, it's like the ocean is rotting, has been rotting the steel, right, because it doesn't belong there. And so it's like, what does it mean for us to be also in solidarity with the land and with waters that are fighting against borders too? Mm -hmm. um, and kind of, you know, using that to, to really imagine and see it fall, see them fall. And even with, um, the border creating slow death, the fact that U.S. San Diego Tijuana border is the most trafficked in the world, mm -hmm. and post 9/11 it has had so much backed up traffic because it's slower to get through from Tijuana to San Diego, that now there's so much air exhaust from these cars mm -hmm. that the air pollution is so thick for everyone that lives along the border that a lot of people have lung cancer. A lot of people, yeah, the, the, the vegetation, people who have fruit trees or whatever, they're just full of, you know, lemons and that are so black because the air is so thick of pollution. So if you think about, you know, U.S.-Mexico border, San Diego, Tijuana specifically, high security station post 9-11, air pollution, environmental racism, and slow death of mostly people of color who live along the border, all of that is because it doesn't belong there. Mm -hmm. It creates death. Um, so how can we tear it down? It's a perpetual question. Like the physical border matters to, to, to us that have lived there. And who's invested in keeping this border? And who's invested, exactly. Yeah. I'm liberated from the So I think this is do you have any questions? There's a two minute video that we're going to watch. So we're gonna oh, watch. Yeah, 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 let's watch. Uh, it. Mass demolitions risk. Uh, Hamda interview community leader of Wadi Homeless in uh, Sulbahir. Yeah. 
Um, so we're gonna go ahead and move on. Yeah, yeah, I have it already hooked up. Yeah. And what did hummus is the value of hummus? Hummus as in hummus, as in hummus. So everybody's gonna go ahead and start. It's just two minutes. I'm the resident and community leader of Wadi Hummus Sofaher, a Palestinian neighborhood in the southeast of Jerusalem, explains the impending demolition of 100 homes in the area, along, the devastating effect, along with the devastating effects it will have on families there. It actually did happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the demolition has happened, taken place. This was before the demolition. Demolition has happened. They destroyed the homes. So. Yeah. It's in, in a, in a boor, uh, little place in, in Jerusalem, in the neighborhood. This area, more than 6,000 persons living here, uh, are legal houses, it is legal houses. But uh, the ruler of the Israeli military in the year 2011, he decided that uh, he would take more than 250 meters from both sides side of the monetized wall. This wall separating the Palestinians from each other. It is not separating the installer, installers, or the install, Israeli installment. There is no Israeli installment to survive. This is the situation, and we think that they want this area to be empty to allow to their installments to be expanded here in this area to close uh, the Palestinian uh, land of Jerusalem uh, by installments and to separate them from the uh, geographical connection of the West Bank of Bethlehem and Hebron and uh, other West Bank. The need is just to make it an empty area. The Israeli High Court in the event of last month decided for uh, 15 buildings uh, and uh, it's allowed for the military to do what they think that it is good for the security. Destroying those buildings. That means that stage one destroying 15 buildings, destroying 100 apartments, uh, killing 100 families. Hundreds of apartments are in danger of demolition. And most of them are uh, families living in these buildings. Uh, the family going to that not to demolish the building, they will uh, do a camp, small camp or camps, and living here because they don't have their money, they don't have another land to go to do to, 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 to a new construction, they don't have the ability uh, to do that. So, where they, or, or they will kill themselves, or they will live on the uh, destroyed buildings on the uh, camp or something like that. <laughs> so this interesting thing about this place is that this is a neighborhood that Israel has, uh, it's an area, in, in area A. Area A is the Palestinian Authority, which is Israel supposed to be withdrawing from. So this, this people went and asked for permit. I mean, usually Israel says that if you build without a permit, we will destroy your home. Mm -hmm. And they don't give permits. So people build, and then the Israeli government or police, not just in the, in, in the 67 occupied areas, for Palestinians inside Israel who are citizens. Mm -hmm. People, they ask for permit, they won't give them permits. So then they build anyway because they need to live, right? So then Israel comes, the police inside Israel comes and says, you need to demolish this home. You have to pay $100,000, that's how much it costs, for the bulldozers, for the helicopters of the police, for the police dogs, because if you don't pay this, we are going to do it and we're going to charge you more. So people end up destroying their own homes. Now with this area, actually, the, this, the difference between this and even the other areas that these people have actually asked for permit and received permits from the Palestinian Authority, which was the only authority in the land, according to the Oslo Accord, that was signed between Israel and the Palestinians. So this is actually legislated by Israeli government. Mm -hmm. And then they went and asked permit, and they got permits, and they built. Israel then decides that we need more space to have the apartheid wall. Then they decide that we, they need to basically connect the settlements with each other, the colonies, on Palestinian land. And so they have to destroy. And then they move, and they tell these people, you, it needs to, you, you need to get out, because it's security. So like the story kept, kept getting like, Develop, 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 and then they went and they destroyed. They just destroyed this whole neighborhood. It's gone. And it was a big campaign 
for a while, but it's just, it's happened, it was sometime in, in July, yeah, July 21st, yeah, see? I opened the map if you wanted to just explain kind of the, the boundaries of the oh, Yeah, see, area C is the, area, uh, where is, area A is the, and I mentioned it when I, when I was reading, area A, according to the Oslo Accords of 1994, area A is the area which is supposed to be Palestinians control. Supposed to be Palestinian control. Israel ra does raids every single night. Mm -hmm. Every single night they go and arrest people. Every single night. So it's not actually like a sovereignty. There is no sovereignty. Area B is the area that's supposed to be joint Palestinian Israeli control. And area C is supposed to be Palestinians are in it, but it's supposed to be Israeli control. All of this is supposed to be, have been completed in 1999 with the final uh, status uh, re resolution where the Palestinian state will be founded. And of course, deadline has come and passed and there is much more annexation of the land and now yesterday Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu gave a statement that once he gets elected he's going to annex the all the Golan the, the, the Jordan Valley which is actually even to the east of the West Bank he's going to annex all the settlements there the colonies in order for people to elect him so he can actually you know uh, get the election and next week if you come on next Tuesday for the for the GOPS Ahmed event here, we're, we're going to have some discussions because we will start hearing, because of the time zone, we will hear sooner of what's been going on with Israel. I mean, like it's not going to change much, but this is what he's been trying to do. So then they, they went and destroyed it. And this is not the only community. There is like multiple struggles that are going on. Sometimes when people internationally launch campaigns, mm -hmm. it, it stops it. But it's, yeah, it's a, it's a sort of creeping annexation. But that's what happened to this Community. There is what happened last week. I think um, I'm not sure. No, you, you. I think you watch it. Salim, you and I watch it. The Edward Said course. When we showed the, um, we were co focusing on out of place, mm -hmm. the memoirs of Edward Said, which talks about mm -hmm. basically home and diaspora and these themes. So we showed the video that the BBC did uh, a documentary about Edward Said going from one place to the other, and he goes visits a, a group called Arab al Jahalin which is now the same area of quote-unquote Bedouins who are being displaced in the West Bank itself. And he was, in 1992, still kind of like people were still organizing. And there's so multiple communities that have been destroyed many more and more and more times, and then they've been, yeah. So this is, this is why the, the video, and, uh, and actually when we put it in, we, it was back when we were working on the syllabus, so now it's all new, so we need to kind of like update it and keep adding new things. Uh, by the way, do the students have any questions about? Uh, yeah. Well, maybe you need to say something. You hate that. I feel more comfortable just with, with us talking, but yeah. Okay, yes? Yeah. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. You can do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what? Do you want to say something? No, Blanca didn't comment in the last round. I did comment. Oh, yeah. you did? Oh, I'm sorry. I think I talked about the inclusion of yeah. belonging. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Moderator. Moderator. Okay. Um, well, I think that I think if we want to go back to um, the questions that we that we're raising today, keep the computer I, keep the computer closed, yeah. I challenge you. Yeah. Um, well, no, because I'm thinking of a few things. I'm, yeah. I'm thinking some of the things that we do uh, that we do. I think I would like to do is to go over the readings of this week and have a discussion about like how far you've come and what you've read so far, and actually like begin unpacking. Um, some of those readings. Why don't you do that? Um, yeah, should we should we start? I mean, we have. If I can just pull it up mm -hmm. on the. Do you want to talk about Audra Simpson? We can. Yeah. So we have Audra Simpson's work. We have the Our Roots Are Still Alive, and then we also have Ella Shahad's work, and we also mm -hmm. have the videos, including. Um, I don't know if you've been able to watch them, but the Elauda. Yeah. The Elauda uh, means. Um, Return. Return. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was a conference held in uh, LA. Um, it's the Alada Palestinian Right of Return Coalition. 
So there was a morning session um, keynote that Dr. Abdelhadi gave, and so that's also on the syllabus to watch this week, as well as uh, Deadly Exchanges, Policing Resistance Movements, Prison Abolition, U.S. and Israeli Collaboration, that was... The, the Deadly Exchange next week, and uh, there is going to be the Constitution Day Conference, and as I mentioned it to you, this is an opportunity to attend and report on it for um, part of, you know, September 28th is approaching soon, so... This is an assignment, so you can have an opportunity. But there is on, uh, I think it's Tuesday morning. Yeah, Tuesday morning on the 17th of uh, September at 11 o'clock at in Jack Adams. All our panels are in Jack Adams Hall. So you can go and attend, and it's going to be actually organized by Jewish Voice for Peace, which is the group that launched the Deadly Exchange Project about the collaboration between U.S. quote-unquote law enforcement, and I don't, you know, call law and order, law enforcement, whatever, because I really don't think it's enforcing any laws. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's just making people's lives worse. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, uh, and, and the Israeli um, security, kind of like military, police, etc., etc. So the Jewish Voice for Peace who initiated this, they have a panel. So it's going to be at 11 in the morning on next Tuesday. So that is something that you can watch. I would say if you're going to be writing your project and you're going about that, Watch the video because it will really help you. It has all this description and then you can. And by the way, for the people who are not in the class, they're online. I posted already the readings online and the links and everything so you can actually click and find it. The Al-Auda conference, the, what's significant about it, in addition to being a national organization of uh, like basically diasporic Palestinians, is that it was the 70th anniversary of Nakba. Mm -hmm. So Nakba is the the foundation of the State of Israel on May 15, 1948. And the 70th anniversary was a very important anniversary, uh, both because it is like Palestinians want to remember what has happened and don't want to forget. But secondly, is because now we're talking about 70 years. People have been 70 years, so there aren't that many people who are left who actually experienced 1948, the Nakba. So um, part of it was the question of oral histories. Part of it is what does this mean? How do, what do people make of these anniversaries? How do they think about them? Part of it was to think about not only 1967 Israeli occupation as the occupation, but also to think about what does it mean for 1948 when, when almost a million, 750,000 to 800,000 Palestinians were displaced. What does this mean? People have like, what is it now? Maybe fifth generation refugee camps? living in refugee camps. And more Palestinians actually live in refugees. More Palestinians are refugees than Palestinians who are on their land. And this is, it's, it's, uh, it's shocked, right? So it's a very huge Palestinian population and the US government with Trump, Kushner and so on are actually trying to liquidate completely, eliminate any kind of discussions of the Palestinian refugee, refugees and their entitlement to being able to return because there was a resolution in the United Nations, 194, saying that Palestinian refugees should be able to return or be compensated if they don't wish to. But uh, now so there were some a lot of discussions about being compensated, but the Palestinians, the Palestinian refugees say, we want to be able to exercise that exactly the way Lankas talk about the, 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 the Catalan, Catalan people, the, the way any communities, are, they, they have the right to be able to say, this is what we want to decide. So once they have the right to be able to decide and so on, they can decide if they wish to return, if they wish to be compensated, whatever. But that is what is called inalienable right. It's a right that cannot, nobody has the right to give it up. Nobody, not the, not the Palestinian Authority, not the PLO, nobody. Every, this is a right preserved reserve for the refugees. So that's why it was actually very important um, anniversary, the 70th anniversary. This was, and you will see when we talk about the Palestinian, uh, the Teaching Palestine project and so on. So do you want to talk about, uh, you want to talk about uh, other things? Yeah, maybe we'll just do a little bit of connection for like two, three, like, like two, three minutes and yeah. then we'll expand it. Mm -hmm. So just to um, kind of, I actually want to begin with the uh, chapter on building the Jewish state. Mm -hmm. So now thi this chapter in Our Roots Are Still Alive, like it's from that book, Our Roots Are Still Alive, this chapter goes Can into the period of post 48. Our are still alive. Yeah. This is a historical um, text. Some of it is very outdated. Mm -hmm. But this is a book that was composed and put together by a group of activists in the US who were, who were very much involved in Palestine solidarity. 
Some people went to study in, in Beirut, at the American University of Beirut, as, as exchange students, right? And then they, they just learned more and more and more. And it was a book that was published by something called the People's Press. Mm -hmm. And this was a series of books. For example, there is a book called Claims of Resistance about Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and so on. So it was a whole bunch of people who actually were very much, so it's historic. Mm -hmm. So uh, some of the, the, info, the, the, the analysis and so on needs, to, and it was organizers, activists who came together, got the information, got some text, uh, produced the, the text and so on. And I was actually talking to uh, other activists to think about maybe we should like try to see if it can be updated it can and the person told me the the, the, the my my comrade said why well, yeah yeah actually i've got permission from them to do it but it's going to require a lot but it's for historic value that i think sometimes like just we showed the film on jack shaheen and even though some of the the material should be critiqued and so on it's also really important to kind of say some of the things came from here. This is their, their own historical perspective. You read Edward Said, you also know there's some of the stuff. Historically, men may be revised, people may have done much more work and so on, but it's really also important to kind of say this happened here and so, yeah, so, yeah. So that's, that's yeah, so good, yeah. Talk about yeah the so yeah. The, um, what that chapter is about specifically is, um, if you could just read really type here, yeah. Uh, is what's happening post-1948, right? So, I mean, the context behind this is you have uh, Zionism as a sort of colonial project, begins in the uh, end of the um, 19th century, um, massive foothold by the early 20th century. You have waves of settlers, uh, Zionist settlers going into Palestine, and you have beginning of waves of, uh, of, of accumulation of land and dispossessing the Palestinians, but it takes its, um, the, I guess, the most intense period emerges with 47 and the when the British leave and then there's this intense fighting and, and for because I want to talk about it in the sense that the Nakba is not it's commemorated on one day but it lasts it's a months and months and years and years long process and as we argue it is continuing today right and so I want to situate that context to say so what's happening this is where the this is where the chapter begins of saying what happens after the Israeli state declares itself for the Israeli state and what happens after um, the, uh, the the armies, the international armies, stop fighting? Right. This is where this is where that this chapter begins. And so now it's talking about how does it how does it cement and keep hold of that sort of colonial project, and of and of how does it keep hold of keeping the Palestinians out of Palestine and preventing them from returning. So this mm -hmm. is what they mean by yeah. building the Jewish state, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, it's a matter of continued dispossession. Mm -hmm. And so they talk about the process of the emergence of a military governance. Mm -hmm. And so Palestinians from 1948 to 66 lived, lived under a secondary mode of, of, of military control. Um, and these were Palestinian martial, martial, martial law. law. It was martial, yeah. Exactly that, it was martial law. Yeah. Palestinians were forbidden, uh, Palestinians who were living in what was then the Palestinian state uh, were issued special permit. Mm -hmm. um, and they were forbidden to move from one community to the next, if they, if, to travel in anything. And if they did, they had to have special moving permits. Mm -hmm. We see this akin to um, apartheid in South Africa. They and Homa spoke about that. And Homa spoke about it as well. Um, and so this is this was also a way that they prevented refugees from coming back because those who didn't have permits were uh, shot or or arrested on the spot. Um, and it also was a mode of controlling Palestinians so that they so that, that there was no mode of resistance. But also many have argued that this was also a mode of capitalist exploitation, right? And so they were able to um, they were able to confine the Palestinians like Palestinians couldn't access their farmland without having special mm -hmm. permits or if there was collective punishment they were denied access to it right and so then you know the, the, there's whole analysis on the question of the hamula or the community structure of how it was deployed as kind of um, the second arm of the colonial power so that the Palestinian leadership was given was 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 told kind of you have to keep your Population in they Chuck, made right? them leaders. They, made them, yeah. they were made, not exactly. leaders. They made them leaders, and then they appointed them the task of policing their communities. Exactly, yeah. and so it became this self-policing mechanism through this mode of the military apparatus, right? And so we're talking about a, a, a con confinement, right? Now we look to Audrey Simpson's work on Mohawk and Eruptus, and you're talking about how uh, this is actually the introductory chapter, the one that we're assigned this week. And so she begins by giving a, a, a history 
of, uh, of Mohawk sovereignty. And so she begins by talking about how the Mohawk community that actually resides in the, in the areas uh, that they are now, specifically the ones that transgress the borders of the United States and Canada, um, have actually, are, dis are actually a reservation. It's actually a displacement of the original community um, and forced into this community that, that, that then signed a number of treaties with the United States and Canadian, uh, uh, Canadian colonial governments um, that temporarily, or the promise, the allure was to establish a sense of sovereignty in a specified location. So the original displacement and then saying, just settle here and we'll allow your sovereignty. But what she documents in that first chapter is historic modes in which all of these colonial governments have violated uh, the, 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 the sovereignty of the Mohawk nation, um, and also the, the ways in which Mohawk nationalism emerges um, and, and re shifts, right? The, the consistent shifts in how nationalism manifests itself under duress and under the conditions of settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you kind of you see just immediately in this like you know three minute summary is the conditions of internment, the conditions of confinement, the conditions of boundedness, the conditions of and, and what what she sets up in that chapter is that under the under this under those um, what I, under those treaties that are signed with the Mohawk Nation and the Southern colonial governments of Canada and the United States is that while the boundaries transgress the colonial boundaries. It is suppo it's supposed to be that the Mohawk have sovereignty over their entire land, regardless of what the colonial boundaries may be. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they move across with colonial, with, with not colonial, mm -hmm. with, uh, with Mohawk, mm -hmm. uh, Mohawk passports, right, the red cards. And what happens is that after 9-11-2001 and the hyper-militarization of the border, we don't always talk about the militarization of the, of the Canada border. And where it was hyper-militarized was across indigenous spaces. Mm -hmm. And so what she talks about is, the, is how this militarization is, a, is yet another mode of the, of the violations of indigenous sovereignty mm -hmm. um, and the fact that you have indigenous peoples who are, are entitled to their land and have the quote-unquote proper documentation as, as the Sutter colonial government deemed of them, right? And then it continues to be violated, right? Mm -hmm. And so the process of Southern colonialism isn't one about fairness or treaties or proper paperwork that we kind of hear in the media, in the media today of like the question of documentation or undocumentation is that even when one has documentation, one's rights are still infr in, in, uh, infringed upon and violated on because the individual and the collective under basis. Security. And under, yeah. under, yeah. Under, mm -hmm. under the guise of national security. Mm -hmm. But it is a process of Southern colonialism. But it's US well. and Canadian national security, not, not Mohawk Canadian. No, 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 yeah, exactly. And we kind of see the parallels with like even across history and across spaces, but across these colonial contexts of, of that, of the question of mobility, right? I mean, really the question of, and sovereignty, right? And it's, and they're, they're very much interlinked in these spaces. Um, you're not in your head, you're not in your head. I see a lot of head nodding, people want to comment. So I'm just going to stop and throw it out there. I, I also wanted to say something that after 1948, the borders were porous. So if anybody who's interested, uh, let me just say one thing also. I also posted the uh, recent declaration that last weekend by the Red Nation in solidarity with Palestine. They mm -hmm. came out with a very strong statement that it's posted on Facebook. So we'll, wherever you go for the class, you will find the statement. But uh, in 1948, the, the borders were still porous. So um, if you're interested to kind of like read even literary work, you should check out uh, uh, which borders were porous? Uh, in Palestine. Within they were, Palestine? They were, yeah, in 1948. Oh, within and no, 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 not within Palestine. From Palestine and Lebanon, for example. The borders were not as, were not as, still as tightly secure, secure for Israel as they are now. So people will go and come. What is the name of Elias Khoury's book? Oh my God. Oh. <laughs> not, oh. Uh, not the sun. Anyway, I'll remember it. Yeah, anyway, there's the sun, a very, the very good... Huh? The sun. Something the sun. I think it's there. Anyway, it's a very good... It's a, it's, a, it's a novel. It's a fictionalized account based on this Lebanese writer, Elias Khoury, interview with multiple generations of Palestinian refugees. Mm -hmm. And it, is, it, oh, it actually shows how they, were, how they were going back and forth. Mm -hmm. So the border, people will come. They keep going back and forth. 
and then actually Israel solidified the borders, so people can't come anymore. Gate of the Sun? Gate of the Sun. The Gate of the Sun. Babi Shams. Babi Shams. Yeah. And it's, it's uh, so there is, and, and there is a film that's made about it, and I think the, you know, well, the film never reflects exactly yeah. what, uh, what the play. book is about, yeah. but you so can see, yeah, I know. It's an actual play, I think. Yeah. You're in video. <laughs> but it's very because the Palestinian community inside Israel mm. is now living under martial law mm. cannot move from one place to the other there is resistance taking place but there's, it's very brutally suppressed this is from 1948 all the way to 1966 the borders is porous a bit right? so people are going back and forth and, but the whole way in which history is constructed is that Nothing was going on. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, even the Palestinian master narrative, if you will, is sort of like as if 1948 stopped, and then everything fast forward to 1967. Mm -hmm. After 67, the Israel. So it's kind of like the way history is periodized is actually quite problematic, mm -hmm. because it goes through all the the points of what wherever it is the Israel founding, Israel victory in 1967. Israel's uh, fight with the Syria and Egypt in 1973, the October War. I mean, like everything. And actually, it's not even called October. It's called in English Yom Kippur War. I mean, nobody even thinks about it. And then they said the Six Day War because they want to claim that it was six days because, like, that was the official fight between Egypt uh, and uh, and you, and Israel immediately mm -hmm. displaced uh, the whole. Di di what is it? Not displaced, paralyzed the Egyptian mm -hmm. air force completely. Like that couldn't go anywhere. But it's kind of as if there was no resistance. Right. Like nothing was going on because all the whole history is told from this is kind of like the status quo history when people say this is history. This is big history. Big history depends where you're looking for, where you're standing, what sort of politics of location you are. Mm -hmm. Who is telling the history? How it's being told? So this is the whole history is discussed that way. So kind of like if you shift it around and say, oh, let's see if we can tell the history differently. How does this history look to other people and so on? It may not be the same history, but this is the way it's told, kind of like it's all of the, and so there is a process which we are very much, you know, kind of like subscribe in the Teaching Palestine project to kind of rethink what do we mean by history? Who's history? How can we think about in kind of like in, in, in history there is something called new social history, mm -hmm. or like the small cases that you think about that actually psh, expose bigger issues and so on. How do we think about that? How do we think about the history? And how do we think about different points in history where is it possible to think about, for example, comparative partitions, mm -hmm. like 1947? What do we think about that? In 1948, Israel is founded, and so is the National Party in South Africa takes over, and apartheid is deepened. Can we think about that as well? 1936, last, last year, last, yeah, last fall we talked about that. It's like you now you have the 30s, the Republican, the Spanish Civil War going on. And when people say the Spanish Civil War, it was basically because the fascists refused. They refused the elections of the Republicans to, to, to power. So they wanted to crush them. I mean, it's kind of like, and so, but at the same time, there was a huge 1936-39 revolt going on in Palestine. Mm -hmm. So, and it doesn't get talked about about the ways in which that actually even redefines Palestinian history mm -hmm. and speaks about when people say the Palestinians, we say, well, are you, who are you talking about? Mm -hmm. You talk about some elite? Are you talking about grassroots mm -hmm. people? Are you talking about the labor movement? Are you talking about women's organizing? Mm -hmm. What is it you're talking about? There's multiple histories that are going on here. Mm -hmm. So when you say the Palestinians, mm -hmm. who are you talking about? Which is exactly the way in which kind of like this divide and rule. Mm -hmm. So what Salim is talking about is that Israel comes and says, we're going to divide the Palestinians inside Israel. Bedouins, Bedouins become a species. Mm -hmm. There is Muslims, there is Christians, there is Druze, and there is Muslims. It doesn't even work. It's kind of like apples and oranges. Doesn't even make sense. But then they go and appoint who are the leaders of each community, and then they assign those leaders of the communities the right to police the communities. Mm -hmm. So then they come and they say, for example, oh, but that's what the leadership wants. That's what the Palestinians want. And I go, that's not what the Palestinians want. You didn't even ask. You didn't even ask, give the Palestinians a referendum to say what they want. You haven't even asked them what they want. You went and imposed your rule upon them and said, this is, this is what the Palestinians are. And then there is the whole knowledge 
machine, knowledge for oppression, that starts churning up all sorts of studies about what the Palestinians want, the, what the Palestinians are all about. So all the knowledge in English, we know in English, most of it is dominated by production of the Israeli Academy. Mm -hmm. That has a specific, because it's a state institution, the universities are part of the state institution, they have an interest to perpetuate the same kind of knowledge in order for them to be able to keep control of the Palestinians. So the discussion is always about what's happening in traditional Palestinian families. And a lot of people say to you, this actually doesn't even make sense. That's not the reality what it is all about. But that is the way in which, that is what we kind of like, when, when I keep talking about the whole challenging the boundaries of knowledge and so on, it's very, very important to also think about that, to kind of like, what do we, when people tell us this is the story, what story we're telling, what story we are hearing, what kind of history we are, uh, and this goes in all, in all communities. I think, like in the US Academy, at least, critical ethnic studies have been able to challenge, but it has not yet has a space the whole, for the question for kind of like, not only Arab American, but Arabness, mm -hmm. Palestinianness. The whole question of the transnationality, for example, of Palestine. So it's always a question, are you talking about Palestinian Americans? Mm -hmm. Palestinian Americans will belong in ethnic studies, but Palestine belongs in area studies, Middle East area studies. But you know, and when we say, but American studies, area studies. American studies, area studies. And you should really call it US studies, yeah. unless you really talk about the whole Americas, right? Yeah. And so there is kind of like, it, and so it is segmented, so it's kind, there is the Africana. Africana talks about, African-American talks about, Africa talks about the, 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 the African world, and Caribbean, and so on and so forth. It can even, you can talk about um, African, Africans in Britain. I mean, there is a whole bunch of like ways to think about it. The history of colonial, colonialism, Belgian and other colonialism in Africa, G German and so on. But when you talk about kind of like, um, uh, what happens to Arabness and Muslimness or Palestinianness in, it's not there. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's actually, it's not only that there is the curriculum that's being kind of proposed now for the uh, ethnic, for the K-12, but it's not even kind of like the body mm -hmm. of what ethnic studies is all about. And it's not defined like on, according to the same criteria mm -hmm. that other areas in ethnic studies are defined, mm -hmm. which some of it is sort of like very US centric, but some of it, you know, like Latinx studies, the reason it's called Latinx studies in San Francisco is not anymore called Raza. It used to be called Raza, mm -hmm. because Raza was talking about within the US. Mm -hmm. Even though it was a subversive, mm -hmm. you know, kind of challenging what it means and so on, mm -hmm. La Raza. But at the same time, it was within the US. So Latinx studies, Latinx was actually an attempt in order to challenge mm -hmm. that there is something called Latin American studies, there is something called Hispanic, Hispanic, okay, and, but, I mean, there is, it's very, it's, it's, a, it's an innovative thing when people talk about Asian American studies. It's mostly Asian American, it's also Asia, actually, Asia, half of Asia, because the Western part of Asia, all the Arabs in Asia and so on and so forth are like, are not really part of it. But there is also people who are talking about transnational, but when you, when you come to the whole question of Arabness, Muslimness, uh, areas that Ahmed studies, for example, and focuses on, it's not, it's not even, there isn't even, it hasn't even been discussed or kind of developed, except very small on the margins and so on. So that becomes also a question of to think about it, because you need, you need to define it, you need to make it a legitimate part of the discussion, and you need to also fight what Blanca began talking about, the whole Zionist movement that is basically trying to cut off, and now trying to claim ethnic studies, mm -hmm. when, you know, like, if, I, and I think it's really important for people to think the, on, the, on the lawsuit that they sued us and they failed miserably. We defeated them miserably. The first page of the lawsuit actually talks about the biggest problem for Ahmed is because 1968 there was a strike, there was black studies, the College of Ethnic Studies was founded, then Ahmed was in it, and kind of like, you have a problem with it. Why are you now talking about ethnic studies? I mean, you know, do the same, the same line of Zionist argument. So this is kind of, so, but this is something that actually a big sort of epistemological mm -hmm. not, not production of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Let's say struggle that we need to actually think about that. And that in this sense, is, it's not, a lot of this stuff is also kind of like re-inherited from the very quote unquote conventional canon that looks at various studies and so on. It doesn't have, 
it has not it hasn't even studied the more innovative things about rereading Palestinian history, mm-hmm. thinking about Palestinian society, Arab Arabness and so on. A lot of this stuff is reproduced. For example, a lot of the stuff is about even Islam or it's all post 9-11, 2001. Yeah. There isn't kind of like the whole history of Islamophobia and what happened from in 1942, what happened 1492, what happened in the Crusades, what happened, mm-hmm. what was the discussion going, what was the relationship between the Crusades and Africa and Asia? I mean mm-hmm. this is this is part of what was going on. Who were the Crusaders? And who was who fought against them? You know, there is a neighborhood in Jerusalem, Bab al Magarbe, the Moroccan Gate, that is it they're displaced now. But this is where the Afro-Palestinian community came, lives, lived. Mm-hmm. And the Afro-Palestinian community, their roots were Africans from Chad, Muslim Africans from Chad, who came to Palestine to fight against the, the European crusaders. I mean, this is, this is where the descendants, too, they were, people, people says Afro-Palestinian, Afro-Palestinian, they actually don't even know about where the history is. And if you go and talk to the activists in the Afro-Palestinian community, they'll talk to tell you where we used to live in Bab al-Magharbe, the Moroccan, mm-hmm. which was completely raised in order to build the new Wali War. Mm-hmm. So people don't even know about that history and don't know that this is there is a linkage between the Crusades, the development of the of, of, of the whole of the Rios Catalicos in, in, in Andalusia and uh, the, the the Ferdinand and Isabella in fourteen ninety two to take over. And then sending Columbus on his lost journey that ended up destru- destroying all our lives, right? right? So it's like the connection is not e- actually there. It's kind of that kind of historical trajectory. It doesn't even, the people don't even think about it. And we keep talking about it again and again. And we keep saying, like, you know, when people were kidnapped from West Africa and brought here and enslaved, many of them were Muslims because mm-hmm. West Africa is dominated by Muslims. Mm-hmm. I mean, the religions are mostly, Central Africa is not, but West Africa. Muslims, and they used to write on the walls of the cells Quranic verses, and but it's, it's completely like it's not even it's not even part. It's kind of like in Muslim studies, mm-hmm. in Islam studies, yeah. but it's not actually, it's not in Africana studies. Mm-hmm. It's not in ethnic studies. Mm-hmm. People don't know this stuff. You have to actually kind of like inter- so. There is a lot of stuff that actually requires a com- reimagining, rethinking of the production of knowledge around. You know how it fits and where, yeah. I felt the same thing for Latinx studies because everyone talks about mestizaje and indigeneity and you know Afro, you know Latinidad, but there's also Arabness within Latinidad mm-hmm. for for a long time. Long, a long time. Yeah. You yeah. know, we yeah. think about Palestinians pre, you know, forty eight that are in Central America, yeah, yeah. Chile, everywhere. In you know, Cuba. Ottoman Cuba, Empire. it turns out yeah, that Cuba. the first people who went to Cuba, mm-hmm. actually, we, we thought, we, we also thought they were Lebanese and Syrian. Mm-hmm. And actually, no, we met with the director of Casa Arabe in Havana. And he was saying, actually, the first mm-hmm. were Palestinians. And he has all this research. and Like, but all of this stuff is unknown. Yeah, 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 Latinx Where? Study. Yeah, yeah, non-existent, Where? yeah, Where? absent. So, mm-hmm. but I think it, I mean part of it is is a gap in knowledge, yeah. which is exists in all the disciplines. So it's something to kind of like to think mm-hmm. about it. Part of it has to do with the quote unquote national security of the United States and the the, the imperatives of the mm-hmm. empire, mm-hmm. right? And part of it has to do with a very uh, strong and concerted Zionist kind of like a, uh, knowledge production ideological in order to kind of prevent these kind of linkages because if people talk about it. So a lot of this stuff is kind of like about Africa. It's all talked about Arab slave trade. Mm. And it's, yeah, of course, Arab, yeah, it's true. Arabs used to, so everybody used to trade in slaves. But they weren't only trading in African slaves. Mm-hmm. And this was not the institution of slavery. Mm-hmm. That was institutionalized in the Americas. Mm-hmm. This was, I mean, like a lot of the slaves within the Muslim empire were uh, Eastern European because it was about war. It wasn't about the color of the skin. This was the racism attached to the color of skin. This came out later on, which was very much attached to the project of colonialism mm-hmm. and, and the, the, the settler colonialism, right? So, th- but that is not, you know, like so part of it ha- actually is very, very much connected to, is- to Orientalism and, yeah. and Zionism, yeah. very, very much connected to. Mm-hmm. Bernard Lewis was kind of like, you know, huge in that yeah. sense. But, that, but in order for us to be able to discuss that, we have to be able to have the intellectual space to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the intellectual space was that. Mm-hmm. 
Bianca, did you have a question? Um, oh, no, yeah. I didn't have a question, but I mean, it's something called on me. Mm. Um, oh, I just wanted I didn't to want to put you on the spot. It's okay. It's because yeah. I get really uncomfortable. Uh, but it's okay. Um, anyways, yeah. um, I was just yeah. saying, uh, well, I was just thinking because I took your summer class, Islamophobia, mm -hmm. um, and the a hatred. And um, I remember I posted my like response to like the readings and stuff. And I remember I was like surprised, like I was literally like so shook that I when I read somewhere or you said it in one of the videos, um, how um, people who were brought who were um, brought here who like you know the slaves were Muslim. I, and then I remember I like posted that that was like the biggest thing that I learned. And I looked at the other responses, and every single person did the exact same thing. And I was like, dang. First of all, my question was not special. My comment was not special. But I was like, wow, that says, I think that says a lot about like just the way we learn and like what we're taught. Mm -hmm. And then also like, I just learned right now that there's Muslims in like Central America. I didn't know that. Like yeah, I assume. Yeah. Three presidents of El Salvador were Palestinian. That's right, that's right. One right now. Even yeah. like, who, who, we yeah. don't like <laughs> him. <laughs> we don't like him, <laughs> we don't like him <laughs> but yeah. 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 But yeah, see those things that like I didn't know and I know like, this just sounds like really funny, but the mm -hmm. first time I figured out that like, there's Mexican who are Mexicans who are Jewish was through a novella and that that was it and I was like brother yeah and I was like and I was like thinking I was like I don't like I wasn't taught these things and I feel like it's just it should be important to t like to teach these things and like um like well, yes within our own fields but also just like in general and I feel like um like I want to be a professor but I also like always think about teaching like younger kids mm -hmm. because one of my professors uh, recently just said there's too much unlearning to be done by the time mm -hmm. we get to college mm -hmm. and these are like the things that I feel like should be taught at like high school levels and stuff like I don't know, I just feel like it's really important. But yeah, I just want to say that. So I learned you a lot. wanted to say something, and then yeah. you left. Yeah. Um, you said you wanted to say something. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I think um, I think one of the things that we should, I mean, we're gonna we, we would have to unpack as well is like the the colonial histories of why those those are the case, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact that like under um, under a lot of the colonial histories, the a lot like the the British would use and a a, a lot of uh, not just the British but a lot of other colonial empires use intermediaries. Um, to get the job done, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we, you know, Dr. Homodar was talking about um, the, the question of indentured servitude, but also the fact that, like, the question of colonization of, of South Asia, right, mm -hmm. was not done just by British soldiers, the mm -hmm. colonization, of, and the fact that the um, South Asian soldiers, soldiers were then taken out of the context and then put into other colonial contexts South to help Africa colonize uh, in South Africa, for example, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I think, but the question of of like greater Syria, right, yeah. the historical context also is raised because a lot of uh, what is now Lebanese, but what wasn't at the time, those were taken as second, as, as intermediaries for the colonial projects in terms of its business apparatus, right? So it became, look, if you want to unpack more. Yeah, but and I mean, so some, that's of, some of the Not everything, it's not some, hegemonic. Yeah. No, 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 but I'm not saying that every yeah, single one yeah, was, yeah. but I'm saying that we do have to acknowledge yeah. that a lot, yeah. that a lot of like, the, the Lebanese who have, or the Palestinians who are rising to power and like are these presidents yeah. are and part of the, of the elite, elite class mm -hmm. yeah. who, who established that aspiring elite. Yeah. Yeah, or aspiring, aspiring elite, elite. Yeah. because there is different multiple levels of elites depending on global oh, yeah. power. Yeah. But I mean, it's like, like part of it in Latin America, you mentioned the Jewish presence of Mexico, for example, mm -hmm. right? It's very, very interesting because a lot of the discussions around 1492 and the conquistadores, mm -hmm. it doesn't even talk about who came mm -hmm. with Columbus as he got lost, mm -hmm. who came in the second, what is happening, you know, but it's also what is happening also in Andalusia. Mm -hmm. Because after 1492, many of the Jews and the Muslims were forced to convert, to become Christians. And they were tested if they converted or not by forcing them to eat pork, for example. Part of that, the celebration of pork so much in Andalusia has to do with this. And a lot of people basically hid their practices. And so today, some of the younger generation do not even know why is it that their families did certain things, certain rituals, that then they, oh my God, my family was Muslim at some point. My family was Jewish at some point. And many kind of like in the, in the process of a collective amnesia. And collective amnesia is not, it's not an accidental process. Not, it's not sort of voluntary and individual and so on. It's a project. It's a political project that's part of furthering a particular dominate, dominating project. Okay? This is people, I mean, Ernest Renan in his article, What is a Nation? He says that in order for a nation to become a nation, people have to forget as much as they remember. So they have to forget that they slaughtered each other in order for them to become a nation. 
But in this, like let's say what happened with Andalusia, there is until now, not everybody is reckoning with the history of what happened in Spain, what happened, the, the inquisition, the interrogation, the conversion, forced conversion of Muslims and Jews, which was quite brutal process, right? Mm -hmm. Some people ended up in Latin America. Some people ended up coming and there is like very little, it's not really part of the dominant history. It's still in the cont of the margins of history, right? So that's, that's part of it. With the, with the Arabs, uh, uh, many of the Arabs who immigrated to Latin America came during the Turkish rule because a lot of the young men were conscripted in the Turkish military and they did not want to serve anymore. They really didn't want to serve. So they escaped. So in Brazil, for example, they refer to, to Arabs are Turcos because they had Turkish passport. If you read the novels of Porque Amado, which is like very popular novelist and so on, they're all Turcos. Turcos this, Turcos that. And they weren't really Turks. They were Arabs who had Turkish passports. So they ended up settling in Latin America and they, in, in many parts of uh, Latin and Central America, which then brings up the issue, what was the relationship with the people who came either came earlier with the considerers or came later in the question of erasing the indigenous cultures mm -hmm. and what was going on at that time. So this is another, like one of the young people we had in, with us in Palestine and the teaching Palestine was a Chilean Palestinian mm -hmm. who was talking about the Maputo people and the, the whole, uh, Mapuche. how Mamabuchi and how, w what was the relation. So like today there is a lot of solidarities yeah. going on, but she was talking about also the history mm -hmm. of it. And part of it is very is similar to the US, part of it is not in Arab American history that, and, and I argue that people who come to the US, immigrants, new immigrants who come to get herded into whiteness mm -hmm. as the minute they arrive, kind of like they arrive, Ellis Island, El Paso, uh, Kennedy, wherever they land, they land off the plane, the next day they, they become, because they want to actually climb the social upward mm -hmm. mobility. So they identify more with the dominating, which is, it's not, an, it's not an exceptional thing. But they actually, this is why a lot of immigrants, for example, after 9-11, 2000, they all have these flags and so on, over, over expressing. You don't find as much of it in like elite white communities. Mm -hmm. They could not they care, okay? They don't really have to prove themselves or show they belong or they didn't, they whether it's true or not, yeah. right? Yeah, they don't need to overcompensate. But so there is this kind of like, there is a lot, and uh, some people participated, so there's like history of people who participated in the movements in Chile, in Argentina, and Brazil, and so on. And there is also part of the people who were part of the, the ruling class who participated, for example, in the overthrow of Salvador Allende in Chile, and, and other places as well. So, and it's not exceptional. It's kind of like, but one, one part only get, end up being remembered and not the other parts. It's kind of like exceptionalizing the people and furthering the hurtage. So this is some of the stuff that actually would be really, really exciting to get people like Latin, La, uh, Latinx studies, mm -hmm. to be able to think about that, to be able to discuss it further, because there is actually a thriving field now okay. of Arab Latinx studies. Oh. Be, I mean, there is people like in Brazil, in Chile, in, in uh, Argentina, in a uh, little bit in Ecuador, not a whole lot. Uh, definitely in Cuba. In Cuba, mm -hmm. it's Casa Arabe, I mean, oh. unbelievable, you know. So there's, there is stuff that's going on. And it's not, uh, you know, what I wanted to also add to the last point that Salim was talking about, the whole question of the ways in which colonial forces um, in, um, uh, use people, like subs force people, subjects, colonize colonial subjects to become part of the service of the empire. Not a lot of the time, but one of the things, and I don't know if you read in other classes, but it's, for example, Franz Fanon or Aimé Césaire. I mean, are, you, are you familiar? Aimé Césaire who wrote a small pamphlet called Discourse on Colonialism. Franz Fanon is the one who wrote The Wretched of the Earth, Dying Colonialism, etc., etc. We're reading Black yeah. Skin, White Mask. Yeah. Oh, class, okay. yeah. So yeah. you'll read it. Oh, yeah. Uh, he was from Martinique, from the island of Martinique, the Caribbean mm -hmm. island of Martinique that was colonized by the French. He was conscribed to service in the French military. Then he ended up being assigned in Algeria because he was a psychiatrist, to the mental hospital to treat Algerian patients during French colonialism. So he's treating and he's treating, and you know, psych psychologists, you're a psychiatrist, you're supposed to treat one individual case at the time. All his cases amount to a collective psyche of colonialism. So he starts 
making his observations, then throughout this process, first he's, he's actually appointed by the French colonial rule in Algeria. And he's like this mental hospital, right? Then he ends up switching and joining the Algerian French uh, uh, Liberation Front, the National Liberation Front, and writing in the newspaper Al Mujahid, and ends up actually negotiating at the United Nations with the Algerian Liberation Front on behalf of Algeria with the French for the independence of Algeria. I mean, this is kind of like, and a lot of people don't know that. They only think about France for only in black skin, white mass, and so on. But this is black skin, white mass, which is, you know, yeah, yeah. But there is like a lot of, we also have, I think we have some, some stuff on the, on the African Revolution from the collection of essays he wrote uh, when he was writing for Al Mujahid. He has like a few actually really, really nice uh, essays. I'm not sure that, I think it's either in this class or the other class. I'm not one of them. Anyway, so this is kind of like, this is really interesting because this is how Gandhi ended up in South Africa too. I mean, this is kind of like how people move from one place to the other. Sometimes they move because they are moved. Sometimes they move because they're searching for different opportunities. And when they do, the question is how do they come, what happens when they encounter the indigenous population? What happens at that time? What's going on, right? Because so like the Afro-Palestinians, they come from Chad to fight with Salah al mm -hmm. for the liberation of Jerusalem against the Crusades. They end up settling in Palestine and Jerusalem, end up living in Hayy al -Maghari. and the reason it's called Moroccan, because Maghreb is not Moroccan. Maghreb means people who come from the West. Because they came from the West to Palestine. They came from Africa, which is the West of Palestine, to Palestine. Mm -hmm. So they came from the West, not from the East. Mm -hmm. So that's why they're called Hayy al Maghreb. It's not the Moroccan. It's the Western, the, the neighborhood of the, West, of, the, of the Western people. And it's not the same as Gharb, because Gharb means West. And people say El Gharb, they refer to El Gharb today as like the colonial. They say the West, like El, um, uh, Stuart Shaw talks about the West and the rest, which the West refers to colonialism and so on. Or people will say French means foreigners. So there is kind of like different relations. So this is when they people said Hayy al the, the neighborhood of the people from the West, mm -hmm. they're not talking about foreigners. They're talking about people who came to fight with Salah al -Din against the Crusades, who were co European colonists who came to control Jerusalem. And so the development of that ends up being in 1492 with the takeover of Andalusia and then the beginning of quote unquote discovery or whatever it is. So I mean like all of, there's so many connections, you know? I mean like imagine yeah. if we don't have to spend our time fighting all these battles and actually can <laughs> defending ourselves and actually can develop this kind of, I mean, yeah. it's, Amazing. It's yeah, it's like so exciting. It's just I think, right? Mm -hmm. Janelle, do you have something to add? Um, it's definitely exciting, but also you know exhausting at times. Uh, it's exhausting, you know, yeah. too. It's like yeah. the having to keep that battle, and it's just I, I I couldn't help wonder, you know, as I reflect on like power, that's just something that's been ruminating with me for the last few days. In you know my own personal work space for different reasons and their perpetuation of like. Mm. So and I wonder, just like, and I think I'm like, oh my god, like how, how do we keep doing it? Like, mm -hmm. Do we have any other choice? That's true. This is the question. I mean, we do, but then really we die like very unexciting, uninteresting life, you know, just yeah. uh, boring, yeah, you know. Sure. So I think, yeah. I must. Do you have anything to add, Jaime? Do you have anything to add? Leslie, give the last word, you and Salim. Let's get rid of all the discipline. <laughs> <laughs> and on that, good night. <laughs> Let's get rid of schooling. <laughs> well, not schooling. Schooling, yeah. But it should be different, uh, like the experimental learning. quality. We 